Yeah. Both of you, I had a root canal. Yeah, yeah. But I'm doing absolutely nothing tomorrow or the next day. And then I so it's just the sun, right? Yep. Uh, it's just looking at the weather charts. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the three to five, you're it's warm. It's so warm. It's warm. Yeah. Yeah. Population will be dead. What's that? Yeah. Um, halfway through the shower, will be alive. I haven't seen one on the horizon yet. You know, they're cold. The very this uh, La Nina flow, which is that northwesterly flow, you yeah. can call it wind instead of snow. Right. Down slope wind. And that's just continuing. Yeah, I want to see a good one. Definitely need the moisture. Like California, yeah. Considering what Tahoe is doing, we have to believe California has gone nuts. Can't say that we've had any very close to record snowfalls here. No. And if you look at the mountains in California, you know, three feet. I imagine the watershed's doing okay. It's close to. Yeah. Is it ready? Right, we're ready to go. Oh, we're uh, to get Mr. Chris. Yeah, I think so. Not Chris was still coming. Yeah, I th he was. He gave me a. He was meeting with him. I'm sending him a message. Ryan, did we want to start with us? Yeah. I forgot yeah. how this starts. <laughs> John, you can just. Okay, we're ready. We're ready. going to watch me and I'm going to record yes. the show today. <laughs> well, that's time. Okay. Well, thank you. Would you call the meeting to order, please? Yes, the meeting is called to order at 7.03 p.m. Take the roll. Chair Williams. Here. Vice Chair Reese. Present. Commissioner Glasser. Here. Commissioner Cornell. Here. Commissioner Duggan. Yep, here. Commissioner Herring. Yep, here online. Mayor Fritz M. Mahold. Here. And please note for the record that currently we are missing uh, Commissioner Rivera, but we are expecting him, and Commissioner Dye will be absent. And did you get Linda? I think I, I, I saw yeah. Linda, yes, okay. All right. Very good, thank you. Um, do we have any public comment on any uh, item that's not on the agenda? It's not, actually, we should do minutes first. It's, uh, let's do the approval of minutes first. Uh, has everyone had a chance to review, read the minutes? Yes. yes. Okay. And uh, thanks, Britt, for putting those together. That was your, your first set? Yes, that was my first set. Okay. Good job. Good job. Nicely done. Uh, anyone have any comments or anything to bring up? Corrections? I just had the one typo that I already gave to you, Rick. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, oh, yes. There it is. So please note the record at 7 on 4 p.m. Commissioner Rivera is present. <laughs> okay. I make a motion to approve yep. the minutes of January 25th as read. Second. All right. Uh, Commissioner Duggan. Uh, Commissioner Cornell. Yes. Vice Chair Reese. Yes. Chair Williams. Yes. Commissioner Rivera. Yes. Commissioner Glasser. Yes. And Commissioner Harry. Yes. And Mayor for the hold. Yes, for the part that I was there. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you very much. Okay, now do we have any public comment on any non agenda items? We don't have any public here. Do we have any public online? Mm -hmm. We do. No one is raising their hand online. No one's raising their hand. Okay. All right. Then we'll move on to our uh, first action item, which is a ordinance amendment for lot line consolidations in the 
CBD. And let's see, I guess, Miranda, you'll introduce this. Uh, action item. Well, Attorney Madsen is also on and can jump in where I leave off. Um, so just a really quick background here. On January 17th, the Board of Trustees passed an emergency temporary moratorium on the acceptance or processing of applications or approvals of properties in the CBD for subdivisions. That moratorium expired on February 22nd. On February 21st, the Board of Trustees discussed amending Chapter 16 and 17 to require a condition that for that a, a planning de development would be required for any lot line consolidation in the CBD regardless of size or regardless of whether it meets current PUD standards. So it would just require no matter what, if you sought a lot line dissolution or consolidation, it automatically triggered a PUD before you could develop it. What it does mean is someone could go seek a lot line consolidation. They don't have to come with the PUD ready. It just means at some point before they can develop, they need to go through the PUD process. The Board of Trustees did ask the Planning Commission to move this meeting up, which is why you're holding it on the third Wednesday, because they plan to hold a public hearing about this ordinance next week on March 21st. If approved, it will then take effect on April 23rd. Right now, there are no applications before the Planning Commission. Oh, did you want to go, Jennifer? Oh, that was me. Okay. Uh, there is no application before the Planning Commission, but we do have one pending for a lot line consolidation that the applicant hopes to bring to you in April. So based on this timeline we have outlined here, this new ordinance would be in effect before that application came before you, which again would automatically trigger that PUD. We did provide the ordinance as that attachment. The BOT did review the draft, and so they are aware of what is in this ordinance. But of course, we want planning commission feedback. So that's the question before you is, do you have any feedback or changes you'd like to see made to ordinance 838? And then ultimately, we're also looking to see if you recommend approval for the Board of Trustees of 838. Attorney Madsen, do you have anything else to add? Uh, I don't have anything to add. I'm happy if the Planning Commission would like, I can go through um, the specific amendments in the code, but otherwise, I think we can just open it up to questions. Okay, well, thank you very much. I guess before proceeding, I'm just ask the commission members, does anyone have any personal or financial interest in this ordinance? And does anyone have any contact with anyone involved with this to be excused? Nope. nope. Okay, let's continue. All right, and questions for um, town staff or attorney Madsen with from the planning commission. Roger. It is. Yes, the pack is actually very clear. I, I guess I was from the hearing, you know, from going to the board meeting a couple weeks ago, I was thinking that it was kind of the opposite that if they did a lot line resolution that they would have to go into a PUT and make that. So, you know, if we don't do anything, what was the problem with how it was? Because, you know, the first statement of our code, you know, where, you know, any development needs to have a PUD. So not every development triggers a PUD. And so everyone. one of the concerns was that the original lot line consolidation was planning commission approval only. It didn't go before the board of trustees. So the board of trustees did talk about, you know, do you add another step? But the feeling was, what's the point? You know, if you really care about the development itself, weighing in on the lot line consolidation doesn't give that authority to then weigh in on the development. And if there is no PUD, and someone builds within kind of use by right, there is no ability for the town to really step in and maybe add those regulations that might come under PUD because it doesn't qualify as one meeting it. So we felt that adding this trigger of a required PUD was an important way to not only ensure Board of Trustees weigh in, but community weigh in altogether. You know, the PUD really is kind of that blank slate where you can now add in the different setbacks or other considerations. And it could be an issue is that 
parcel size that isn't large enough or it doesn't have the multifamily units to trigger the PUD. So we want the PUD regardless of size or use. So that's actually basically it's just a one little phrase that says and one acre. Right, so there are parcels that are not that are under an acre, and so that, that's what you're trying to correct. Yeah, so we really applies. We definitely did want to take care of all the parcels because yes, there are large parcels in consideration for lot line consolidation, but there are smaller ones that the, the feeling was if you want public weigh in and public input on any development in the CBD, the PUD was really the way to go about that. Yeah, chances are when it's got it, so yeah. that's very comfortable, very much. Uh, what discussion did we have to not do this for commercial? Wait, what? Or not to do it if there was a current zone commercial? Is the fact that we looked at the lots and there are all these bigger lots? The board didn't really get into discussing other zones. They were focused entirely on the central business district. So that could I, be recommendation, but Attorney Madsen. Yeah, I can I can provide a policy background on that. I think that the thought um, related to land development and um, lot consolidation processes is that typically um, those lot consolidations are administrative because the goal and the desire is to combine lots and have bigger lots in certain areas. Um, and that would be in areas maybe that aren't in the downtown area where you want to have infill and you want to have growth. Um, so that's the reason to have the PUD requirement for the lot line or the lot consolidation in the downtown area um, and not in the other areas because, like I said, the, the goal would be to encourage people to combine lots and um, have larger lot sizes. Oh, I understand it. Just looking at the zoning map. So I mean, there were, I don't even know if there was any commercial lots that were not an anchor. But yeah, compared to the uh, CBD had many very small lots. So I, I see the logic. I was just wondering. Thank you very much. I clarified it and, and the uh, way it's highlighted and where you laid out the the, uh, the the packet. It's it's very very clear. So thank you. I also wanted to, to just thank you back quickly on that to say that I extremely uh, appreciated the all caps differentiating the, the language. Uh, it was very easy to see the changes. Uh, and I hope we do that for all, all the stuff going forward. Uh, but I thought this looked very straightforward and uh, triggers that opportunity for public comment, uh, you know, through the PPD process before uh, any major projects go forward. So it seemed like you could accomplish the goal that the BOT was uh, trying to do. The caps and the strike on the you can see where it's changed. Uh, so, yes, thank, thank you for doing that. Uh, any other questions before we open it up to the public? Is there any specific event or happening that was the impetus for this coming up? Great question. <laughs> pardon, pardon my ignorance. Um, so what, what happened is we received an application for a lot line consolidation, and it was uh, the one that's coming up in April. Correct. It was for a very large parcel in the central business district, and and there was just this moment of realization of okay, these lot lines can go forward with planning commission approval, and the board really felt like there was this need to assess, you know, what is the future we want for the central business district, and how do we add in some of these additional components where there is public consideration or board consideration. So that's why the moratorium took effect. And so under the moratorium, we really assess like what's the path forward, and it's twofold. It's this, you know, adding in this PUD component, and then also looking at developing kind of sub area planning under the comprehensive plan process to provide better guidelines on what we'd like to see the downtown central business district look like. Okay. Because again, pardon the basic questions, but um that better. Pardon the basic question, but what what was the fear then um 
on this pending application if we did not have this new language in place. In a, in a broad sense. Sounds like term action. Do you want to take that one? <laughs> Yeah, I think the fear was a little bit of the unknown of the potential development that could go into that CBD lot if all of the lots were combined. Um, right now, the CBD zone district has no minimum lot size, no maximum lot size, um, no requirement for only one primary structure. Um, it's just the, the regulations in the zoning code related to the CBD aren't very specific and don't include um, the, the visions and the goal of, of the comp plan from 2013. And, you know, potentially if, if the vision and goal of the town has been, has changed since the comp plan was adopted in 2013, um, certainly, the regulations don't include um, whatever the current vision is for the downtown area. So that was that was the concern: is that it, you know, there was a lot of unknown and a lot of possibility because the regulations um, in the zone district are not well defined. Gotcha. That makes sense. I think what it seems like is adding this, Judge Matson, allows us or approvals of lot consolidation not to be made in the CBD area unless that landowner has a PUD. They're planning, they have a plan ready for that approval. That's really the thing that we're adding here. So I just want to clarify though, they don't have to have the PUD ready at the time in which they seek the lot line consolidation. They can consult, what the ordinance says is that they can consolidate the lot and bring the PUD later. Before any before any development can happen, but they don't need to come with the PUD at the time they seek the lot line consolidation. Okay, so yeah, okay, then what are we doing? Well, that's it. What she said at the very beginning was that it ensures us where before there could be a possibly a way of not of having a development without a PUD, this just ensures that there will be right. that whole process. Uh, they have to bring the PUD. Whether it's so right now. Yeah, they, they, they just don't have to have it at the time they seek. Understood. And that was okay. a bit of a confusion too with the board right. and then they don't have to come hand in hand with okay. them. Okay. And that's and that's that's too. Yeah. That makes it easier for the applicant too. With it. So then they don't have to have everything all at once. Because right. some, app some applicants do, you know, they've noted that they really need the lot lines consolidated for mm -hmm. funding or whatever it might be. They can't come with the PUD because they can't develop without the lot lines being dissolved. And so that's why we didn't want to hold them to have to have them right. together because they, it may be a financial component too of having to then secure the funding. That makes sense. Okay. So if one were to consolidate their lot lines on the two lots that they own and make one big lot, and then a year down the road, they decide not to go through with whatever project they have in mind, is that lot line done and done? And they could then sell that lot as a bigger lot. Yep, they, a new owner. They could, or they could seek to subdivide it. Um, but then even if they sold the lot um, to a new owner, that PUD carries. And gotcha. so the new owner would still have to come forward with the PUD. So that's in regardless. Even though that had nothing to do with them. They did consolidate the lot lines. And so that's but the new kind of owner, I mean. Yeah. Right, that was the big thing in keeping it so that you have that PUD component regardless. Of all gotcha, so the, the new owner down the road, they buy this lot and presumably they would understand that to do anything on this lot, they would have to go through the PP process. Right. Gotcha. Is, is this process completely separate from the zoning? Process? Yes, it is. So the zoning would be assessed during, uh, potentially during a PUD, but you, you're, it could be evaluated, I guess. Um, the zoning, the, the zoning is actually the PUD. So a PUD is is specific zoning and um, setbacks and regulations um, set out in that plan unit development plan. It also includes uses. Um, so it's very specific to the development. 
Yeah, I think that that's where we ultimately landed on the PUD being the, the right like framework or vessel for this is because there are so many opportunities to add in. You know, right now you can build 100 percent of your footprint in a CBD, and then maybe that's not the case when you have a very large parcel. We're going to want to see that scaled back, and so if this is an opportunity to look at all those different components that you wouldn't necessarily do if it was a use by right situation, there, there wouldn't be any triggering for that to ever occur. So someone could come forward to do a zoning change and then do a separate uh, lot consolidation. Let's say they had two lots that one was residential, one was central business district and they change one and they could combine the two of them. But that's a two step process or is it done at the same time? Yeah, I guess they, if you have a oh, good question, Attorney Manson, I think you have two separate zoned parcels they would need to. Yeah, um, you would need to have the one parcel rezoned um, and then combine the lots for that rezone parcel that matches the um, whatever it is. So if it's residential, the residential would have to be rezoned to CBD and then they could combine the lots for a lot consolidation. So that's a two step process. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Well, it, it can be, but it can be. Let me read to you um, 16252, or 152, right in our packet. It's uh, you have a top, which single family, which is the one that we talked about, that being one acre. But B, the yard and bulk, and this actually has come up, and we've actually fought over this over the years. And this is one that I hold dear to myself because I've been asked to help eliminate this. The yard and bulk requirements stated in Article 2 shall not apply to plan unit development except that if a PUD is proposed for an area currently zoned for residential use, the minimum lot area, the current zoning district will be utilized to determine residency density. So that's how we did PUDs out and find terrible roots and stuff, but we said no, it's it's Single family, it's the uh, Mount Residential, so that's how that PUD, all the PUDs we've done use this are strictly residential. Right. So we really haven't done what most people would call PUD, where you're doing mixed use and you're doing commercial and residential, hoping development. The town has always just done PUDs, where we've done residential development. So, I mean, but this is the one that. If someone brings into a PUD a parcel that is residential zone, then if they would do residence there, then this B holds up for the underlying zoning of the residential density. Right. That's why it's a two step process and you can't consolidate until. You can, well, I, I guess so. If it's two, it's two different zoning. I wouldn't argue about that, but it just means that no matter what the zone is. That you know, if they go to do an apartment building, then the residential zoning applies. Unless they change the zoning. But you can't change the zoning if you buy it down the PUD. Well, right here in D it says the zoning change is required for planned unit developments and well, you do the zoning change, but the the number of residents is what it's saying. B says the residents. So I won't argue about whether it's one step or two step. Okay. The important thing is that you you can't have a PUD in a residential area or part of the residential and increase the residential density. Unless we resolve. Unless you resolve. You can't know. Once you do the application for a PUD, that number stays. I think he's saying that you would resolve prior to yeah. getting in for the PUD and right. then we go forward with the uh, well, zoning okay. corrected. Yeah. That's all I was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, someone could have done yeah, if they get a rezone through, sure. Yeah. But then, then that new number is the one that applies. Right. Or, or if it's okay, somebody, okay, we just had an example where someone asked to take a residential to commercial. Mm -hmm. So I guess you're, you're right about that. Gotcha. All right, any other questions before we open it up to the public? Um, do we have anyone in the public who wishes to speak? You have three minutes. Please provide your name and address. Any hands raised? We did have a call on user that I had to mute. So that was an interesting comment.
No one? Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and close the public part of the um, discussion and open it back up to Planning Commission for discussion. Um, let's just sort of go around the horn here and and Jimmy, you want to start us off and tell us uh, your views or any other comments? Um, yeah, these still on our previous discussion there in the last few minutes, but for the most part of answering any questions I have. And I think everything makes sense. There's nothing that sticks out for me is um, any huge problems. So I'm open to hear about any other concerns though. Okay. Roger. Answers the right questions have been answered and down clear. Great <coughs> make motion at the end of the conversation. <laughs> Jim. I I uh, also think this is very straightforward and clear. Uh, the intent, as I understood it, was to allow for the PUD process for public input. Uh, two swings at it, both at the planning commission level and the board of trustees level before any new construction was to start. So it's not, you know, any zoning issues and any of that stuff might have had would have to be uh, taken care of and, you know, and rezoned if necessary before they then try to do this, this process. To get the consolidation, but I think it accomplishes the goal. I was listening to what the BOT was wanting to do, uh, and I think it's very straightforward. And I can support it. Thank you. Yeah, I um, I also like it because I think it provides uh, more opportunity for public input to any uh, development, uh, particularly in the central business district, um, and more chance. Even though it's probably more work for us to do a BUD, I think it's. More fair for the town to do it that way. So, um, my questions have been answered. Chris? Yeah, I think it feels good. Gap that was there, you know, uh, should be, uh, yeah, I guess. Okay. I like it. Best it says right now. I agree with what has been said, and most of my questions were answered. Uh, I think it's really important, regardless if it is a little more work, that the public input is brought up. Because um, there is a lot of um, reaction to that, and I think there's some good comments that are coming for that we learn a lot. So I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay, very good. Um, motion. We want to make a motion. I think it's Stephanie online to end. Oh, Stephanie, I'm sorry. Yeah, I had. Um, this is maybe a concern that would be more part of the discussion around whether to allow a lot line dissolution or not. But I think that uh, um, without the PUD in hand at the time someone makes the request, it does become more challenging, I think, to understand whether it's advisable to allow the lot line dissolution. And so I mean, and this ought to be, I guess, part of this will be case by case as things come forward. But I do have some concerns around except sort of someone coming in and trying to um, dissolve all the lot lines simply for the purposes of, you know, increasing the value for potential resale versus something that's actually in alignment with the town's longer term plans, goals, and objectives of how we'd like to see the downtown develop. So again, this is probably something I think that needs to have to get asked at the time that someone comes to request a lot line dissolution and, and trying to understand the scope of what they're requesting um, and how you know, significant of a lot line dissolution is being proposed. Um, so that's my only, that's my only concern about not having any sense of what would be in that PUD um, at the time that we're trying to make that decision as to whether or not to recommend or not um, to approve a dissolution. Thanks. Okay, that's, that's a very good point. Thank you, Stephanie. Tom, um, with that, which Stephanie is was that? Stephanie Heron. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I've got nothing to add. I especially I agree with what, especially with what Linda was saying on the importance of getting the the uh, input of the public. Um, I think we, you know, I've looked at this now uh, 
for many, many weeks and many, many sessions. I've got uh, nothing to add. Okay. All right. We have a motion. Make a motion. I have a question for discussion around Stephanie's point. Um, what? So, what other obstacles are there, if any, for one that wants to do a lot like the solution on property sale in the CBD? Like in the instance that Stephanie described. Like, well, is so that just like a use? Like they can do that if they want, or there are standards of approval in Chapter 1777 that the board would have to consider. And then I'll just throw out a couple. You know, there needs to be consideration about whether it creates an unusable lot. If it raises significant issues of policy, which are not addressed in the Netherlands Comprehensive Code or Municipal Code. Um, so there are some evaluating criteria that the, that the Planning Commission can consider at the time in which they review this. And I think that, but you know, I do understand what Stephanie's saying. You don't know what the intention is. Um, you know, and I know the board to talk about that a little bit of whether you do require the PUD at the time of the lot line, but like also kind of recognizing that some of these things have to happen in phases and you just create this barrier by having to have the two come together. So I think they're trying to figure out like what's a happy medium yeah. here. That, that makes sense. And having some, I assume, fairly black and white criteria of if it's allowable or not already in place, I think helps quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely for the Planning Commission to discuss once the lot line consolidation does come before you and then we'll put in the aim that the criteria and those are the things we want to discuss it's all five of these whether you do feel like it meets the spirit of this section of code so if it was still this outlandish proposal with all these question marks the planning commission or the board of trustees would still have the ability to deny the Lot line to solution in the first place. So it doesn't come before the planning commission or it's for the board of trustees. A lot line only comes before just stashing. So oh. now if the planning commission denies it, there is an appeal process before the board of trustees. But unlike other obligations, this starts and ends with the planning commission okay. or current lot line consolidation. We talked about adding in another step, but it just felt like okay, again, what are we looking at? We're just looking at the lot line consolidation and where the board really felt like they wanted that public input was on the actual design of the structure itself. That's where the public input felt the most urgent for that. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I just, it seems like, uh, you know, this, this, all this does is add an additional trigger for a PUD once a lot line disillusionment has been approved within the central business district. It doesn't change any criteria for the lot line disillusionment to process or anything that's going to happen. This just is, if this is approved, it just says, okay, this is now going to trigger additional scrutiny of any future building that's going to happen on this property in the CBD. So it's, it's, it's really not changing, you know, I mean, the, 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 this decision and the criteria for the lot line disillusionment is, is stays the same as what it is now. This just adds an additional trigger to give public input before construction can start, you know, people and people start doing things and then all of a sudden uh, the public gets uh, up in arms and they want to come talk to us. Okay, any other comments? If not, let's proceed with a motion. Okay, Chris. I move to recommend approval to the Board of Trustees of Ordinance Number 838, amending Article 7 of Chapter 17 on the lot consolidation process, and amending Article 6 of Chapter 16 on the planned unit development process. Second. Second by Roger. Um, to take the vote, please. Mayor Bud hold. Yes. Commissioner Herring. Yes. Commissioner Glasser. Yes. Commissioner Rivera. Yes. Chair Williams. Yes. Vice Chair Reese. Yes. Commissioner Cornell. Yes. Commissioner Duggan. Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, okay. Let's move on to uh, that closes our action items for this evening. Let's move on to discussion items. We have uh, three discussion items. The first one is the fence code. Um, and Miranda, would you like to introduce the yep. fence code? So I'm going to get it started, but all this work, the, the kudos for this work goes to Commissioner Rivera. So I'll get it started, and then Commissioner Rivera wants to chime in. 
Um, so Commissioner Rivera did volunteer to champion this and and the tasks ahead of us were you know, understanding why the international residential code changed fence height uh, to seven feet without that requires does not require a building permit to look at possible changes to fence height in our code and also clarification on where the fence should be measured. So I won't go into the whole all the information, but Mayor. Billy spoke to two individuals who gave, gave very thorough responses about why the IRC and the IBC made the changes to seven feet. And so that just provides some contextual information. Really kind of the, the, the basis of the discussion tonight is to talk about the fence height and then also where we measure the fence from. Um, so first with regards to the fence height, Commissioner Rivera really noted that there, there are two options that we'd like to talk about. Of course, there are others, but really like it boils down to one of these two. First is that you just change the fence height to seven feet. So what it means, you can go up to seven feet without a permit, and I think over would require that permit. Um, and then again, it keeps kind of the criteria of going to eight feet when you're hiding junkyards, storage yards, and things like that. Screen. Screen, thank you. Uh, option number two is to add language about the variable height and fences. And so under that section A, you have the variable height fence. So if the height of a fence varies due to the features integral to the overall fence design, a variable height element of the fence may exceed the allowed height by a maximum of one foot. So that's another option. Now, do you want to go one at a time or do you want to review them all really quick? Um, we'll just do a, okay. like a brief overview and then Fair. just in chime in. So there's also the, the fence height measurement component where uh, C Commissioner Rivera talked with safe builds and Tess spoke to, there, there's two, I'm not gonna read them in full detail, but there's two visuals here that talk about how height could be determined or measured. And ultimately the recommendation was to add language Implemented. Your copy didn't show the trucked changes. So let me just get to that really quick. That for fences, the sloping, so this would be G on the, uh, I believe that's page six. So for fences, sloping ground or on retaining wall, solid fence height of six feet may be permitted as measured from the upslope property so long as the total height, inclusive of any retaining wall, does not exceed eight feet as measured from the downslope property. So then there's a figure in here that you can see for how that may be measured. So really some of the questions before you tonight are, are specific to those with regards to fence height. Do you like option A or option B? In terms of how the height is measured, do you agree with Commissioner Rivera's recommendations? We also added in another question that we just want to talk about is what are your thoughts about who is allowed to build to eight feet when screening the junkyard, outdoor storage yard, or other legal, legally existing uses? Is it the person who has that property that's the junkyard, or is it the neighbor, or is it both? Who is the defining party? Um, we don't have a recommendation. We really just want to talk it through. And then just do you have any other thoughts for us? But I'll turn it over to Commissioner Rivera to add anything else. Yeah, just to kind of some color to the first one with the two options. You know, I kind of looked at it as do we want to keep our code the way it's been traditionally at six feet and then just have that, you know, extra parameter that was option B um, that allows variability. And, uh, you know, I saw examples of, you know, construction materials variety as well as posts and finials and decorative elements. Um, so that all made sense to me and adding that language in there to allow for that uh you know ability to exceed up to a foot keeps our code the way it is but allows it to basically conform with the IBC um or that's option B that's option B or as the From a practicality sake it allows it to set the feet for an extra design. Exactly. But still kind of keeps the original intent of what we had in our code at six feet as the, the fitness height. Um or we just simplify, you know, some people prefer more simple simplification. Let's just say seven, seven be done. You know, that's the max, that's the max. So that's option A. Um, and then as far as measure height measurements, um, you know, I think we were really just missing some sort of diagram. And it, uh, so that image I provided, I felt like was very clear. It was also 
um, pertinent to the not a green property issue with the height of the fence on one side being compared to the other side. Um, so I think this will make it much straight, more straightforward. And I believe Marina, this would comply with what was built, right? Yes. Yeah. So I think it kind of suits everybody's needs and just makes it clear. So it's kind of why that together. And I think everyone was here. Maybe I can just add really quick the context. So we had two variances that went before the board of zoning adjustment for these exact same reasons, these fences. And while they were approved variances, the board of trustees really felt like we need to look into just the code altogether. So that's why, that's how this came to be. And to Commissioner Rivera's point, these recommendations here would have allowed these individuals to go forward with their fence without having to seek a variance. You say something a little bit about the, the process of approval, say if you went to Option B, where it talked about, um, you know, having approval by the Board of Trustees, municipal facilities, and certain public facilities may have seen height restrictions. Is this a, is this a staff decision or does it go before the, the BCA or how, how you know, if, it's, if we change the code to make it variable, how does that work? So you still wouldn't be able to go above eight feet. That's the max. Right. Okay. So if someone was seeking to then go above eight feet because of their features, they'd have to go before the board of trustees based on this exceeding the fence height. That's a good point. Maybe we can offer a little bit more clarification regarding that process if someone were to want to go above eight feet. Probably well, a little cleaner. Just to clarify, unless you are in this and be uh so the way option b works with a with the first section a it's saying the fence height is six but you're allowed to have that one foot of play so seven but then it says you know junkyards outdoor storage and other legally existing uses um machinery equipment materials automobiles may go up to eight feet Unless going through approval through the Board of Trustees, municipal uh, faculties, yeah. So, you know, it's seven, really. And then for those special purposes, it's eight. Anything beyond that, you've got to get approval. This is the way A okay. and B work together. All right. So, yeah, that wasn't clear when I read um, Agreed. Part yeah. B, I guess, or off from B. <laughs> yeah, it's like part B starts, and then it's like, oh, and then there's this. Paragraph that explains all those things. And I, and I do think that's why we're looking for clarification to just part B altogether, because part B really became this like tricky spot of was the variance required or not. And like it's not clean, clear language. So we do recognize there's some work that needs to be done in addition to the height and how we measure the fence. Okay. Well, I thought that actually made a good argument for just sticking with option A. And, and uh, not allowing other variables and not having the staff have to interpret and then go to a BCA. I mean, it seems like we've had in the past where code was ambiguous that the staff had to kind of interpret stuff. And uh, we thought, you know, I think military, it's the KISS principle, right? Keep it simple, soldier. Just go with the easiest option there and, and take the variability out of it. Variability. That's it. This is Stephanie on, on both A and B. I did have a question about the central business district language where it says that there'll be no um, fence constructed higher um, than 4 feet in height within 15 feet of any lot line bordering upon any street or road or within the central business district. Um, and I'm, does that mean that in the central business district, you can't have a fence that conceals, say, um, like a storage area or a trash area or something like that? It was a little unclear the way it was written. One thing before Marina probably adds is none of that verbiage was changed. Um, the edits that I did aren't really shown on here, but for this first uh, proposal, the edits are really just in A and B, and they're pretty straightforward. The rest of that section is all existing language. Unless Marina. Yeah, no, and, and you are correct there, Commissioner Herring, that because we didn't change it, that is correct that uh, someone will not be able to construct a fence regardless of what it is uh, screening unless it is then determined, you know, then you have this component again back to B and kind of the complexities of B is 
again, that's not clear about zone. And I don't know, Attorney Mads, if you have a legal interpretation of how B or should be C that intersects with B here in fence code. Like, um, I think that's a good one. It's it's not clear. There is some ambiguity there as to how C and B would interplay with each other. I'm just wondering if maybe and maybe not now on the time, Chair Williams, but that would be a great discussion for tonight. Is maybe some recommendations or thoughts about what we could keep working on, not only for B just in general, but the intersection between C and B. Right. No, that was the whole goal was to bring up anything that still needs to be looked at. So I, I wonder though, is that not covered by the part where it says it's available for screening purposes of screening junk outdoor storage? I mean, doesn't that doesn't a trash dumpster even in the CBD fall under that I category? Think, I think it's what's a, what would be as staff, I think what is a little challenging for for us or for me would be okay, you have C that makes it very clear what zone we're talking about, but B doesn't make it clear. Is that all zones? I mean, and I think it could, I mean, turning mass, I mean, where you fall, it could be interpreted either way. It could be interpreted where like C holds true and it's four feet because B is not clear about the CPD component or B trumps all. And it doesn't matter what zone you're in. I think that, that it's a little bit complex that way and leaves it for staff to interpret. And that's kind of where yeah. we're going to in the first place. <laughs> I do think it would be good to clarify that. I will just also say that um, I do think it is helpful to allow people in the central business district to erect tall fences to put things like trash or you know other kind of an outdoor HVAC system, whatever this thing might be. Um, so I, I would hope that B would apply to the central business district, but it wasn't clear from that language. Um, the only other question that I had in terms of where it would be helpful to clean the, up the language a little bit is that in the central business district, it says that material that can't be used that's combustible. I don't know if that just does that mean no wooden fences. Um, it's a little bit confusing as to what a combustible, uh, what, what that means. Um, and I'm also, does that mean that if you're not in the central business district, like say you're in mountain residential, you're allowed to use environmentally unsafe or toxic or hazardous materials in your fence? So I wasn't clear as to why we would only limit that to um, the CBD. I wonder if railroad signs are used. Um, also, a great point. Yeah. yeah, I know that for some of those lot, um, some lots, you know, that neighbors are pretty close, and these fences are pretty close to their neighbors' houses. I'm sure. I know I wouldn't want. Uh, I think with one of the setbacks in some of these places, like they're only like you know five to six feet. <laughs> I wouldn't want a toxic or hazardous material fence um, next to me if I was in high density residential, for instance. And I will say that, you know, uh, fire marshal Johnson's obviously not here, but, but I think we know how they responded fire resistant material is a must. It's obviously a, a new requirement under building code that all new builds are fire resistant. And so I'm safe to assume that his, he would ask that all new fences constructed are fire resistant materials, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of where. Just because you then have your zoning, your, your defensible spaces mean nothing. If you have a fence that can be easily be ignited. But that is covered in the building code? It's covered in the, the building. So I, I don't think the building code then moves on to fence because we have fence, a very specific fence code. I didn't see that yeah, popped over here because I wasn't looking for that. I was going to hide later on. We can confirm. Yeah, I think yeah. it might be worth just looking into it. Yeah. Add that to the list. So it had a lot of expense to, uh, I'm looking at replacing my wooden deck with uh, uncombustible truck decking, and it's about four times the cost. So, uh, boy, that, that's a pretty big hit. You know, they're saying somebody wants to put up a big fence, and now it's got to change from a wooden fence to uh, yeah. trucks or some other kind of material. I'll also say I lived in Austin, and we had one of the composite fences, and even there with the heat, they break this time, they would dry and not very durable. Uh, I hate that <laughs> yeah. But I'll look at the code and see, you know, for fence material recommendations. See, 
I would just say that's not a requirement. I just knowing him. I mean, if, if he had a choice, everything. Would oh, a recommendation. Fire is right. Not a requirement, but a recommendation right. to consider a fire resistant material. Because again, we're really trying to move more towards defensible spaces and being really mindful of that. And so again, just a recommendation, not a requirement. Not a question on uh, the enforcement that's going to come up in our uh, keep the animal one too. Where you showed that there was a fine amount, uh, if it was over the prescribed height, of up to a thousand dollars a day. And yeah, that was both, existing language. Yeah, and, and we wondered who, how is that process determined, and who has to be the one to determine what the amount is. So code enforcement would have the authority to enforce this section of code. Um, Typically, we try to, and again, the amounts of place jump in where I'm off, but we would try to often have language that says set by the fee schedule. So that way, we can adjust it from year to year. We don't love sticking just flat amounts in the code because we need that flexibility. Where this came from, I don't know. I don't know, Terry Mads, if you have any insight. Yeah, actually, so under state statute, municipalities can issue um, penalties up to 2650. Per violation per per day, so that's allowed by state law. And how this would be enforced would be that code enforcement would issue a ticket essentially for the municipal court, um, and then the matter would go before the judge, and the judge would decide what the fine is up to the amount of one thousand dollars per day. Um, now, I've never seen a judge. Um, put in place a fine of one thousand dollars per day or twenty six fifty per day, but that is um, the authority that's provided in the code and state law. And I would suspect, and and Miranda can talk to this. That usually, there's going to be a conversation with the property owner that your fence is in violation of the code, and um, will give you an opportunity to correct it before any. Um, charge or complaint is filed in the court. So should that, do I hear correctly, that should be handled in the fee schedule rather than in the code? Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm because of the state statute component, maybe this is appropriate and often has no, but attorney Manson. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's fine to have it in the code and it doesn't um, need to be in the, in the, um, Resolution set by the board of trustees. I mean, usually you want to give the judge some discretion to set a fine amount. So it's a case by case decision. Okay. That seems like it makes sense. So if there's some kind of a, you know, kind of, you know, egregious violation, he has a lot of flexibility to really hammer somebody, you know, he or she and the judge. Well, if the landowner refuses to do anything, okay. Thank you. That, that helps because I would thought, boy, that would really put a town staff under the garment if they uh, were going to tell somebody that sets a fine of five hundred dollars a day or something. Yeah, and, and to Attorney Madsen's point, you know, State Bill is our code enforcement, and Jake Cook, our code enforcement officer, really does do like multiple attempts. You know, we well, every time he calls me, he's like, we're at this summons level. We really try everything we can to get past that and not finally do a, a summons into court. Okay, any other questions or I have only for uh, Chris, did you have a recommendation on the options? <laughs> Not your I go back and forth because I like the idea of us kind of having our own code that's been around and not been poking with it too much. So B kind of appealed to me, um, but I also don't want it to be complicated. So, um, Simplicity is usually best. Yeah, I think I. Okay, well, let's um, let's get some input from the public. If anyone wishes to speak on this uh, issue, that'll help us with this discussion item. Um, anyone wish to speak on fence code? You'll have three minutes, name and address. Anyone, anyone raising their hand? Beth, I think I have her hand raised. And she may need to call in. Thank 
Anyone else? First. Oh, we're waiting for that. Do we have a timeline on when we're hoping to actually have probably the brings it in? You know, I think if I can get these few question marks, um, um, the parties allowed to build section B, um, the CBD pipe, uh, section C, and then the section, section H, um, the buy amounts. I think I'm going to have it ready for next month. Yeah. That would be drafted up by Attorney Madsen. Uh, Attorney Madsen has enough time yet. <laughs> that might be the. Uh... Yeah. Attorney Madsen, do you think you would be able to get that drafted by then, by next month? Yes. Okay. okay. So you get a review, I think C through J. Depending on which option we recommend. That they like to talk about that C about the central business district. I'll we might as well clean everything up and we'll ignore it. I'll re review those and make them, you know, see if they're fine with the that's the existing code that will change or propose any changes, but I'll look at the um IBC and see if there's anything majorly different there. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Great. Kathleen Chip, I, uh, 32 year business owner. I'm sorry, 32 year resident, 20 year business owner. Um, I suggest that we change it to seven feet. Um, though I'm still wondering if Dennis and his wife have been returned compensation for their SRU or their, I think it was an SRU that they had to apply for for the seven feet because the code as written allows for eight feet. And again, I'm horrified seeing in this packet that staff is asking who has the right to build an eight foot fence. And uh, I can't even believe we're even addressing this because this is still the United States of America and the law applies equally to everyone, both people. Either neighbor gets to build an eight foot fence and pretty much eight foot is the limit. Um, and I'm really upset. I think that Dennis and his wife should be reimbursed for their monies because the town staff, Cynthia Baki, photoshopped or photocopied the, the international building code, which said seven feet. That's what she gave them. And then town staff changed their mind. Miranda changed her mind over what Cynthia had sent and there was a big dispute as if they weren't allowed to build an eight foot fence. They were requesting a seven foot fence and legally they could have built an eight foot fence and legally Miranda Fisher kept telling uh, Knotted Root that they had the right to build eight feet but that um, Dennis and his wife did not. And I, I don't even understand how, how this is a problem. This is a self-inflicted problem. And I don't, honestly, I don't think a change needs to be made at all um, because it allows anybody to use eight-foot fence if they want to block from either side, whether you own the stuff yourself or you want to block out the view of your neighbor's stuff. So I don't, I, I can't imagine how much time Jen Madsen has spent working on this and what we'll be paying for when eight foot has in the code, always been in the code, and anyone can use it that, that wants to use it, except I would argue the central business district since specifically says a four foot fence, um, but anybody in town may. So I don't know. I don't even know why we're. This is on the agenda. That's it. I'm against. I'm against doing anything except uh, that takes away anybody's right to an eight foot fence. And if it makes staff feel better, like they did something, go ahead and change the six to seven. And that's fair since the, you adopted the International Building Code and you gave a copy of the seven foot law to Dennis and his wife. And again, I think they should have their money refunded for the SRU for their seven foot fence that was always legal before this and after this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else to speak? 
Okay, if not, I'll close the public portion of the discussion. Bring it back to the Planning Commission for any other final comments. Um, Chris, if you have a list of questions that you want input on, you know, please feel free to ask those. I think, um, you know, we talked mostly about the first kind of options of AMP. Um, the second section of the second change uh, recommendation was the fence height measurement. And that one really clarifies retaining walls, sloping ground, height, you know, measuring, um, just looking for any input. I, I feel like it's what needs to be put in there for clarification so that it is clear with a retaining wall and sloping, you know, the down slope property can go up to eight feet. That allows for that variance. Um, if there's any input on that, other than that, I think it just cleans it up and makes it simpler. I agree. I think that the, the uh, diagram really helps and showing that there could be up to. I was kind of surprised it was as much as a foot <laughs> variance in grade there, but I think, I think that would solve a lot of problems. So uh, I, I agree. And go, going with option A, is that that aligns us more with the building codes? It does. Yeah. Okay. We're talking C or D. The other options I'm sorry, I'm still, I'm still stuck on the eight foot fence. If, if you go down to page six, right there's a there's a diagram. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, sixteen. That, yeah, and then section G, that second section. Talking about sloping ground and retaining walls and has a lot of C and D. Fence uh, height measurement C. Oh, okay. All the way down there. Gotcha. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, this thing. All right. Well, yeah, either, either one of them it works, right? The other one took care of the slope, too. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, I mean, I think it's the other. I mean, I guess I thought it would kind of be a blend, whether it's the spoke, whether you measure four feet away and there's two feet ever so. But yeah, right. it, this will take care of most of it. This, or okay. this one and one that is D, uh, oh, page four, I see the page number. Page four is certainly the example that came to us. Right. Exactly. Um, and then the other question, I think we need a clarification. Um, that Miranda brought up was, you know, who, who is eligible to build? Um, I don't know, like Roger, you have a lot of background in building. If you have two properties, and I'm property owner A, property owner B, I am the junkyard, property owner B does not. Property owner B has the right to build the fence to the height, for instance, or uh, what do you call it? Screening, screening, screening thing, yeah. uh, up to eight feet. At that point, with our code, that property owner B has the right to do that. They just have to go through legal course and courts to get the share of the money to build that fence. But it's a split of property owner A, right? That has nothing to do with us, though. Right? Yeah, I, I don't know. I can't answer that. Yeah, but those seem to be the example. Well, that was a question Brand asked was a little more clarification on you know, who would be that. And I guess that's why I was kind of lost in thought. We, kept, we had the conversation here about an eight foot fence. So that eight foot fence is the one and only place that we see screening. Yeah, but I think, you know, in, in the situation that came before us, you have two property owners who are building their own fences, like they're not sharing a fence. And so it then became a question for us of, and we felt it was best to go through the BZA of like, who gets to build a fence to eight feet? Because there was, feeling of a property owner then said, you know, yeah, we don't really have junkyard and those things defined here. So it was like, you know, is it the, you know, potentially a brewery who gets to build to eight feet or is it that neighboring property? And so for us, it's not clear enough to say who is the, who gets, who has the ability to build. Is it, is it both, which is absolutely fine or is it one or the other? And I think for us, it's just not clear enough that it can be both. And so I think that's what the desire is of the planning commission. Then we would add in some language that makes that very clean that it's it doesn't matter. 
owns the junkyard. Yeah, we'd almost need to add like um, you know, we run a lot of existing junkyards, outdoor storage, yada yada yada, or adjacent lot owners, something to that effect, right? So that those adjacent lot owners have the same ability to build high since that height. But one thing I might add to, and maybe attorney Mads, and we can take this offline with Commissioner Rivera, is just like the definition. What is a junkyard? What is an outdoor storage yard? Like, it's it's just not clean. And so as staff, we're just guessing our way through it. It's what is considered, you know, other legally existing uses. Like, that's just very open and very broad. And so I think maybe a definition section, attorney Madsen, your thoughts, but we might need some clarification here too. Okay. So, so it seems like what the, what the planning commission can do now is just recommend that, you know, things like, yes, I agree that it should be you know, either either property and on either side should be have an equal voice to say I want the fence. Who pays for it, then that's what you get about. Yeah, it can go on and on. And the, uh, and the description of, yes, it's clear that it's for screening and then it's, when I read all the following things that then it's talking, you would think some kind of like type industrial use. So maybe by saying things like, you know, which zoning that might be, there's ways to, to make it clear for administrator to say, well, this is clearly what it is. It's not a residential parking lot or it's not, you know, my drive, you know, my, my parking lot when it says automobiles, that's not residential driveway. Is talking about some kind of commercial industrial use. So terms like that, I think there's as many as you put in there that would certainly clear it up in the future. That's a good point. One other thing I would add in there, um, in terms of one being able to build an eight foot fence would be if their property is adjacent to the state highway. In terms of noise, blocking out the noise, not keeping anything out, and there's no visual issue necessarily. But um, I, I think that makes a huge, you know, noise and, and visual as well difference to a property owner that lives right along peak to peak on Sunday afternoon in the in the summer. Um, so I would think that should be something that those kind of property owners would have to go through all these special hurdles uh, to build their fence. I think that's equally important as shielding a, a junkyard or whatever. So. Um, I think that could be something we add in there as well. Yeah, and also keep in mind, you know, we're wanting to keep the language fairly straightforward, but any of these can be go under our special reviews if they want an exception. So, you know, do we? I don't think we'll cover every scenario, you know, um, and yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is. Was balance of do we try to cover it all, put it in the language, or make this guidelines so that typical construction will know what to do? Anything above the and beyond that will be an SRU. That's the way I kind of look at it. Is it an SRU or a PCA? There'll be a variance before the Sorry. PCA. Sorry. <laughs> Someone's gonna hear it in some sort of yeah, well, that's, yeah. What's your name? I think that's a good <laughs> Is there anything stated on um, not being the hazardous material issue, but what the fence would look like? What type of materials are used? I mean, could they put crates? Could they put anything to make the fence? You know, I'm not a building code expert, so I think we have to take that offline to Dan Wester just to confirm. Yeah. But uh, I, I, there's got to be design standards in there. Yeah, I mean, well, the outspans are not codified. I don't know if the international residential code gets so far as to tell you what is acceptable building material. Yeah, typically, for fencing, typically that goes under an HOA. They usually have their own set of rules, which may or may not agree with, you know, standard you know, building codes. But I think it's worth looking into, uh, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, can impact the, you know, the names as well as the height. Well, and, you know, again, this is my first time doing a subcommittee, so I, I also tried to conscience of what we call scope creep, you know. <laughs> the goal of this subcommittee was to address height and measurement. So 
I don't know how far you want to go with other things. I'm happy to if that's what people want, but I also don't want to ease you know the public into something that they didn't expect. You know where we're going to be addressing. So. I think that was the only thing we brought up was the yeah construction to just look into building fence construction materials and and design. It's okay. I'll take a look. Okay, any other comments or direction for Chris? Thanks for putting this together. Yes, so the next step then would be to then send uh, everything to attorney Matt and then come up with a we'll do. revised one with yeah, it. And, and I don't feel like you have to try and address and write code to, right. Right, to say what building material or anything has. Right. Yeah, maybe you, you could just tell what us what it is. And, yeah. what else, and what I might do is just put at the end of the code, we, I mean, do we have recommendations in the code? No. Not really. No. Okay. Um, yeah, but maybe we look at materials that could be given out and somebody needs to request your information. From the, yeah, back. you can only like fence one pagers. Yeah. Absolutely. That yeah. like recommendations. Yeah, because we talked about that one municipality, I can't remember which one it was, that had that flyer. Elizabeth. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, making something that the town staff and I hope that would be helpful. So I'll take a look at that. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? We'll close that discussion item and move on to the keeping animals ordinance. Should we take a break before the keeping animals? Anybody, or we just go for it? I, I, we're going to need a break eventually. Why well, didn't know whether we to break out for the animals or I didn't have a lot of people here who want to get in public comments. I don't know if maybe you want to like get it started, jump in. Let's start and then we can we can break it out. Like after public comments. Yeah, just want to remind people of their time. All right. Well, let's, right. let's do that. Um Miranda, we should yeah. do an introduction on it. And then I have a uh, letter from or an email from Mike Dye, who was also on the committee. I'll read that and then Roger had asked me to follow up with your comments since you're on the committee as well. So and there's a lot of kind of clarifiers I'd like to offer that were not clear in the aim and we witnessed that kind of in the public um, response to this. But just to take this back, this takes us back to March of 2022 when this originally came before the board. And the question before the board was, you know, do you want the planning commission to look into the animal section of code? And at the time, you know, currently Tom only has regulations specifically for chickens, horses, and llamas. And so there was kind of a question by some town residents is should there be more regulations for other domestic livestock? At the time I went before the Board of Trustees, we actually offered some very specific examples like Boulder County that has, you can have so many units of animals based on your lot size. It was this very black and white kind of use group table thing. And the Board of Trustees then, which is very different than the Board of Trustees now, their feeling was we don't want to get that, that specific, you know, is there a creative way to go about this? So the Planning Commission looked it over and there was an original group form that consisted of Commissioner Cornell, at the time Commissioner Giblin, and Cynthia Bobby. Um, obviously with Commissioner Giblin turning into Mayor Billy and to be as long with the town. Um, we were a little bit on hiatus and Commissioner Guy then joined us. So as staff, we kind of pulled everything together that we could as a part of just as like jumping off ground of like, here's everything and anything you can consider without actually including a full use group table. There's, there's the makings of one, but not a complete use group table. And we really centered around kind of maybe a special review use. You know, is it that your large hooped animals are just considered on a case by case basis? And we look at your sanitation and your care plans and your ability to maintain your property for this animal rather than boiling it down to your lot is this size, so you only get so much. Um, that's just a, an initial thought, initial stab at this. But as we talked with Commissioner Dying and Commissioner Cornell, there were questions of, is that effective? Is it efficient? Do we maybe just need that kind of use group table because that makes it cleaner? Um, so the feeling, and, and Commissioner Cornell, correct me if I'm wrong, the feeling was like, let's just bring this to you all and let's get your initial feedback. And so I know it's a lot to digest. There's 18 pages and a lot to take in, but 
It was like, why don't we just see where you stand? And, and perhaps the direction has changed. Perhaps the ATS keep going the SRU route. We love the handling it animal by animal kind of feeling, or no, that's really not going to work. We need a more specific table. So um, again, that's why this is coming before you in a pretty raw, rough format. We did not label it as draft, and that was kind of a lesson learned that this is just a draft. It is by no means ready to go before the Board of Trustees, nor is it even ready for your vote. There's a lot of things we still need to work on. We just wanted your initial gut reaction of where do we go from here and what direction do you like? Yeah, yeah thank you for that clarification because you know, looking through the common thread from, you know, from the public comment, I think people misunderstood that this thing is ready for prime time. And this is actually the first time we as the planning commission have seen it. And the reason that I asked uh, town staff to put this on the uh, agenda tonight was so that we would like to get uh, some input from both the public and the planning commission as to, are we going down the right road? Are we going down a rabbit hole? Are we taking on too much? There's just a lot of questions like that that I wanted to get feedback on. And unfortunately, I think a lot of uh, people, particularly in the public, interpreted that as this is where we are going, and it is not. At this point, and I do want to add, so attorney Madsen has since looked at it, but at the time when it, which was decided, like, we're bringing this forward, there was not enough time for her to review. So she too had some comments of, hey, this is going to work and this isn't going to work. And so also recognizing there's a legal component, but again, this is just, it is, I can't say that raw, rough format. Like that is what this is. It's like, tell us what you think. Now, where should we go? What path should we go? Yeah. I think the, the committee did an awful lot of work looking at what other communities and counties are doing and so forth and to gather all this stuff together was was a lot of work but it's by no means fits metal so having that said uh let me uh let me read um the email from mike die who was uh, on the committee and he says uh, dear community members and planning commission and mike couldn't be here tonight um for uh, medical reasons and uh so he sent this along as a new member of the Planning Commission working on the Keeping Animals Subcommittee, it has been my first deep dive into proposing possible modifications to town code. I apologize for not being able to attend tonight's meeting to discuss in person. I want to emphasize that what is included in the packet is an early draft, a first attempt at one possible direction a new ordinance might go in, and not a document that is anywhere near ready to be voted on. There are many sections that in my mind need refinement, simplification, and refinement in some sections that we may want to completely reconsider or remove altogether. I do see the need to update the code to prevent further occurrences arising like the one that triggered this exploration in the first place known as the code incident <laughs> to clean the existing code ensure that animals are treated well and to make a nuisance such as a barking dog an enforceable offense however a large part of me wonders if strict regulation of animals as reflected in this current draft is truly necessary as in my understanding it has uh, very very rarely been a problem Additionally, it is my understanding, and please disregard this if I am mistaken, with the lack of an animal control officer, the majority of the contents of this ordinance would be unenforceable. If that is indeed the case, I see little meaning is creating any ordinance that cannot be enforced. If we do move forward with developing an ordinance, I would like to invite community members that currently keep animals or have expertise in raising and keeping animals to actively, as well as those with concerns, particularly in periodic meetings, so we can create an ordinance that really makes sense and captures the town that we truly want it to be. Mike Dodd. Uh, Roger, would you like to comment from your perspective since you're on the committee? Yeah, you know, Nick. Oops. Amazon. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about this 
been really for two weeks and there's so many thoughts going through my head. So please everybody bear with me and I actually don't want to say a whole lot at this time and just go through there, but um, absolutely. First of all, I wanted to say, Mike, I hope the wife is doing well and uh, sorry you weren't here, but I thank you for also recommending us to have this meeting today and pushing ahead. Uh, it is so essential that we have this meeting, get some open input from everybody. Um, truly, I have to say that myself and Miranda, we work together on this, and th this actually has only started since Christmas. So this hasn't happened because we kind of, you know, as we said earlier, that we had lost, uh, you know, uh, the mayor leaves and then Cynthia leaves and so, and then we took kind of a break there in the fall towards the holidays. So we just started really. And Miranda came up with a, this good draft and and we've really only had one meeting then that we actually gave our input. And then, so this is basically draft number two with the initial changes. So where we at, and I need to try to be brief was that I and I've called and tried to speak to as many trustees as I can, and I haven't been real good on that. It's been hard and they're busy, but I at least have talked to five trustees um, to try to get some input because here's where Rand and I are at. There's a for me there was a big question about uh a year ago, March, when we mapped into that whole goat incident, as it was said, um, you know, we had a lot of people in town had the perspective that the animals weren't allowed in town. And, you know, then Jennifer gave us no, that's the exact opposite. If the code doesn't say they're not allowed, then they are allowed. So that started this whole issue. Um, and I guess then, as we've had the draft, Miranda, I guess you should tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I've had some problems where I feel, or here's where a little bit of difference of how to work and bring to. So it, it is that I feel that the town should decide which animals that it wants to allow and then not allow all the others. And so I spoke right out saying that there are large livestock cows, um, pigs, hogs, sheep, you know, how, why are we thinking about doing a review process for a cow in Sunnyside or a cow in Old Town? You know, why, do we, you know, I, I feel that we ought to just say no. So, and that was just my opinion. And, and Miranda is saying, well, the Board of Trustees wants us, mission us to try to find a way to make some of these things happen. So I, you know, I, I have these petitions, uh, five of them and three people feel that they're not very convinced about having the large livestock in town. And, and two people feel that they just, two of the trustees uh, feel that, you know, we need to keep working on it and work through it. And I did not talk, I have not gotten a hold of two of them other trustees. So it's it's not a consensus. Um but that's kind of where I feel that we're at, that I'm at it personally, that absolutely I you know I wanted this meeting so bad to try to get some more input and from the town and so that we can actually move forward one way or the other. But I think that this proposal we have is whatever that was the, the one paragraph there. You know, which enables special review for, you know, any larger animal. And we have not even begun. If the town decides that we should do the review, then to say, okay, what would be the criteria that staff would look at these and want to analyze the lots? So obviously, yard bowl, just like we had the letters about, you know, you have nothing about prowls and distance. Well, we hadn't even got there because we have to actually find out and decide, um, 
you know, should any animal be able to come, you know, short of a water buffalo, come to town for review, or do we want to have, for me, do we want to have the criteria of saying which animals are allowed uh, and go forward from that? And then just like we have a very big chicken and we've had a, a, a horse and a llama or this has work and our chicken one has you know, been very, very good. Um, and we've actually taken build upon that for other smaller animals that would be engaged as it's a perfect example. And we really have kind of, and we have not worked on the dogs and the pet part a whole lot. We've took, you know, that that draft that you have. And I, I'm, I'm kind of, cause my whole concern is about the livestock and large animals in the zoned area, as opposed to there's an awful lot of feedback just about the dogs and the pets. So you know, it, it's, I think it's, was a very appropriate time to try to get some feedback and to see what people want. But, but for me, it's that livestock and how do we deal with, uh, you know, some of the issues that might be the neighbor issues. And the neighbors, it, you know, that's a hard one to just say, oh, the neighbors will work it out. You know, when someone wants to bring a hog into the backyard, you know, we need to have specific ordinance and we need to say yes or no. In a lot of instances, I'm totally dried out, so I'm going to talk. <laughs> so, so Roger, um, at one time you had mentioned that, um, you know, we should have the ordinance for, you know, certain animals that probably would work and then any that do not, um, then would be a one by one animal by animal basis. I think I heard, um, so that we don't have to try to cover every single animal in the code. In other words, it's you know, do have a special review then for something that's not covered in our code. Can we legally do that? So what we did is a special review used for domestic hooped animal. There is also the kind of definition for small animals. So we tried to really tailor it toward these larger domestic livestock, so that's cows, sheep, goats, horses, swines, and other similar farm animals. So what it did is it did did kind of take llamas and horses and not keep it separate, but then roll it into this just special review. And I think where where the thought process in that was like the board really tasked us with how do you ensure these animals are cared for and maintained? And so really seeing someone's plans for appropriate maintenance, you know, their lot sizes or, or what their plan is, it's, you know, it's hard to say like, okay, your lot just because it's an acre doesn't mean it's suited for an animal. So really kind of thinking those through that lots are so unique here. Um, the special review just seemed like a way to do that and then to really look at this on a case by case. Um, rather than, nope, sorry, you're just not large enough or you don't have these certain criteria so you can't at all. Because I think a lot of people, there are people in the community who are interested in these animals, but may have unique lots and that needs to be taken into consideration for some people. And so that under the SRU kind of gave it that process and the thought was to do it administratively so as to not tie up Planning Commission and Board of Trustees time. What, but then if uh, administratively was denied by the community planner, then there's an opportunity for that to be repealed. But it could be something that's handled on a staff level. If that's handled administratively, does the public still get a chance for it? Yeah, so the way the code reads is that uh, the neighboring community within 300 feet, just like any public notice, would be alerted that an application was filed and they would be able to weigh in the public opinion. Um, kind of like the same way a little bit like liquor is handled, where we do this noticing and then, you know, if you file a complaint, then there would be hearing and further consideration. Uh, but if no complaint is filed and the community planner determines that, yes, this is, you know, the met all the criteria and again we don't we didn't assess what the criteria was because we didn't know how far we wanted to go with this but if they prove that they have a maintenance plan and a care plan and they can do all the right things to truly care for this animal so that's what the board cared about that then there would be no reason not to issue uh but, but to roger's point that is you know that's a the water buffalo like right you've got these very large scale animals that potentially come forward but that's what's happening as town staff is people are calling to ask about these unique animals, not always your traditional, you know, it's like, can I have this pig? Can I have these 
very examples that we don't always see. There's not, it's not just the horses, chickens, and llamas that we we're seeing a lot more other animals that people want to bring forward. And so that's where Roger and I talked a bit about how do we honor that there are people who want to bring in different types of animals. And is it just a flat yes or no, you meet the criteria or you don't? Or can there be a little bit more assessment behind an SRU to just to make sure, yes, you can take care of this pig that you want to bring here? Yeah, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't see how we can cover every single animal in the world that somebody may want to bring forward. We have to draw the line somewhere. And no drugs. Well, no, I'm worried about the line, actually. <laughs> but, um, but but that's covered for it. Like the state or the United States won't allow you to lie. That's just not well. I, yeah, I'm being facetious, but I'm, you know. I know, I know. But the poisonous reptile that gets out. But um, I had a neighbor with a tiger in the end, so. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can. Just well, I think up to a certain age, you can keep a certain one. Um, but, but in any event, you know, we, we need to have the ability so that the public can uh, can weigh in, or the neighbors in particular can weigh in and say, you know, I don't want a lion in this, you know, next door to me, you know. Uh, and then, of course, you have the whole, you know, issue of predators and prey and, you know, that sort of thing. So, I mean, this is a complicated issue. There's no question about it. Yeah. Um, maybe one good thing that came out of the public misunderstanding what we were doing tonight was you got more input <laughs> that came in that, that actually is is very good. So I think um, I think what we'll do is we'll get input from the planning commission first. We'll take a break and then we'll ask the public. Maybe some of the questions for the public will be answered by the discussion we have here. So. Why don't we do that first? Did you have any other final comments before we do that? No, we just are. I think I can speak for Commissioner Cornell. We're looking forward to some direction. Okay. So we can keep going. Because our goal is, you know, we are obviously like a year in the making. And, and to Commissioner Cornell, we just started 90 days ago. We'd love to not be doing this next March. Okay. All right. All right. Anyone want to jump in and sure. make any comments? Go ahead, Linda. Um, yeah, on the special review, I have a concern that it would just be staff that made the decision. And I think that's kind of where we got into the GOAT situation because I don't know who all was informed about that. Um, and it seems like it was a decision that was made and the, the neighbors or the property owners adjacent to that were never informed. So I think that caused a lot of what is happening at this point where we reviewing this. Um, so I really feel it's important that the adjacent property owners have a big input in this. And the accountability to enforce these, we at this point don't, do we have an animal control so capability? We, yeah, so we did leave that in because at the time we weren't really sure what direction we were going law enforcement wise and there were options, you know, option A through C and A has animal control. That is something we identified that, you know, we're going with option C and there's no animal control under Boulder County, you know, code enforcement's only going to go so far. So we have definitely recognized that and now and knowing what path we're going with Boulder County Sheriff, we have to revisit that component. But again, at the time we brought it forward, that was a bit unknown. We were rounding this up to bring it to you. So it would probably go towards Boulder County's animal. Yeah, I mean, right now we're, we're not paying for animal control. Right. So that creates this complexity that we then have to evaluate with Boulder County Sheriff's Office and code enforcement of like where can each party step in. Uh, and some of this language that's in there is kind of tied to our current code that talks about the animal enforcement officer and then it references the town marshal's office. So there is a lot of more work to do there. So I don't have the answer because I think we need to know what is the kind of the future of Boulder County and what they can do for us as well as safe built. But the option to use a Boulder uh, Sheriff's Office animal control officer uh, costs money. Right, and so would that could that be negotiated as part of the contract? Yep. So option A, if you had seen the contract options, option A didn't have this animal control officer. Now, as staff, I did say it and feel that it was necessary. But we've never really had it, and so again, I do recognize in this code it doesn't really work, but. We've only ever had to call code or animal control one time in the four years I've been here and Cynthia shared with me really minimal. 
Um, so that was something to take into consideration is, is that expense worth it when we're just not seeing this? And yes, you could bring on animal enforcement, but then they're just going to enforce more. And so, you know, it's, it's a balance there. So, yes, we, I don't have an answer, Commissioner Glasser, but that is what 100% on our radar from Attorney Madsen, too. Of, we have to talk to both of these agencies and find out where their limitations are. And that would bring up the type of animals that are allowed, and that goes back into fencing. What kind of fencing would be allowed for certain types of animals? And so that would be an issue with uh, the height on, and the type of fencing. And also, I feel that the predators are becoming an issue even without having other livestock in town. And the predators, which this is their home, are being uh, intimidated by and lured into town by different animals. So um, I think we have to really consider the safety of not only the animals that are brought in, but the residents and also um, the predators. That's all I have. This, um, <clears throat> I think, first off, I mean, this was a lot. This is a lot of good work. This is a ton of very thorough language. I think it was very, it's a big undertaking because we're trying to address a lot uh, through this one process. And, uh, you know, I feel like it covers very specific things all the way down to like, you know, the age of newborn puppies and ways <laughs> they get counted at not. Which is very thorough and it and it handles, you know, the the questions that could come up. I think my only challenge a couple challenges with it. And really I think I see it as an opportunity of maybe we use this as a buffet and we pick up all parts out of it that are what we because the way I look at it is this is a code for a town that has enforcement capabilities, has staff, has you know, even people, uh, you know, to be able to know that dog is a town dog and it's registered or it's not, or that is somebody visiting who's hiking. I think that's just a reality that we live in that we can't really even manage. So it's it's almost doesn't make sense to me to put certain things in here, um, especially around the household pets, um, the limits, the licensing, the leash. I mean, I have neighbors that walk every day and I've probably been doing it for decades without leash. And I think that's part of our culture is that wise due to our current predator situation, maybe not, but I will walk my little dachshund, but I don't think the town maybe should say or have in the code that it's required or that that dog can be, um, you know, detained and fined and that kind of thing. Um, yeah read through a lot of the public feedback. There's a lot of good stuff there. Um, the other aspect I'm thinking we should look at is we had that whole survey, a public survey and input where we're trying to get, you know, is this really covering what the people kind of voted and gave their opinion on? I see the grid and it's basically household pets and chickens are automatically a certain quantity. And then everything else is going to require reviews. Was the public's vote, and maybe we try to use that as um, to justify kind of some of the code writing that we're doing. Hey, this is what the public said. This is what the public wanted. We're going to try to make this in alignment with that. Um, and maybe part of that is somebody recommended in one of the feedback emails um, looking at boulders property size per animal. Quantity and then there was a chart there. I don't know if Miranda, you got to ever see that or look at that. That's actually what we brought before the board of trustees in March, and the yeah. board was like, We don't want that. They didn't like that the, the animals were called units. That was a big thing, but okay. the feeling at the time was, Do not replicate that. That's the directive uh, I got, which is why we've been so resistant this whole time because it was like, Don't do it. And we did talk with Commissioner Cornell and Di about like, well, do we go back to the board and say, we tried, but this is really a functional model 
Let's use this. And I haven't seen it. Is it related to large animals? It's like all stuff? animals, and I can pull it up okay. really quickly. I, mean, I guess the way I'm looking at it is maybe we just, for our needs, make it around larger livestock, non household pets, non chickens for that purpose. Because that's going to handle most questions is, well, my property is a quarter block or quarter acre, or my property is an acre. Okay, well, here's what I can do. And this is pretty straightforward. This is what we're trying to prevent, especially in our uh, commercial residential area, Sunnyside, Old Town, that, that area. Um, and maybe we make it also specific to certain zones. Um, that, you know, I think once we start dictating, you know, how many pets on a property, household pets, once we start dictating, like, um, you know, it's hard to say, should we be determining whether someone is home long enough, you know, <laughs> and are providing their own um, people checking in on their pets? It's hard to say because, again, enforcement and, you know, the, I don't know. I guess the thematically, that is kind of where I'm at. Is I'd love to see the more um, livestock related stuff, more specific, I think, and more in the code, and less of the household pet stuff, just to keep the tradition of where we live. Pets are off leash, pets are coming and going with hikers and visitors, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I guess that's kind of my key. And so, Commissioner Verve, you really can't say this very well, but I can say that. So, uh, what it is, is it's a unit, and then uh, the units are tied to how many acres you need. Right. So, it does not talk about domestic animals in the units, but then on page two, it also references the four. And just a clarification on the domestic. The four really came into anything over four was then a kennel operation. And so then you're talking business licenses and all these different things. And so that's why that four became a trigger. It could be removed, but then I think there has to be a threshold about what is considered a boarding house or a kennel or those types of things. Like when have you then brought in too many domestic animals that now we're looking at a business licensing situation. So we will need clarification there, but. Um, this is what we share with the board. This is what was brought forward by the residents who were concerned. And this is kind of the direction was like, don't do this. Yeah. And so they were like, oh, okay, like, what does that mean? And then it was Cynthia and I were just like spinning our wheels of how do we not do this, but then get the same outcome. And, and again, some of that conversation is thanks, we try, but this sure. is the right thing. I'd like to go to Tom yeah. if we could to. Maybe get a little bit of the I just want to comment just about this. So, because I've you know I've looked into this. So, to me, the issue here is that you know when we looked at the Boulder County, they actually have two zonings, and there's the rural residential, which goes up to lots of 35 acres. So you're talking Boulder County. Then you have suburban residential, which is very defined areas near I-1 and IG. And there, the, the standard there is identical to Netherlands. You're allowed to have five chickens, two beehives, and if you have a half acre per pasture, a horse. And that's it. So the idea that we should go into talk, looking at and evaluating Boulder County, fair, but understand we're talking rural residential, we're talking 35 acres. How do you get into, okay, they sell these animals. So that's why I just okay. wanted to clarify. So a suburban residential is like what I feel we should be looking at when we compare. That makes sense. Tom, could you comment um, from the, um, the board's perspective exactly where the board sort of thinks that this keeping animals ordinance is going or should go? Well, uh, I'll comment first on what Roger just said. Um, I agree 100%. Uh, I, I, I think that they should line up. Frankly, from the board's perspective, we looked at this so long ago that I think if you shook somebody uh, and said, uh, tell me about the animal ordinance, they forgot it. Well, I do just want to, if I can piggyback off of this, only two out of seven were on the board in March of 2022. We've got five new ones. So Mayor Billy wrote an email today saying, you know, he wonders if, if we're even going the right direction. 
I'm going to tell you the board today could feel very differently than the board that gave us the original direction. Right. I misunderstood. I thought the, the new board right. had discussed this. This is the March 2022 board that said, don't do that, do something else. But then to Roger's point, it's really unfortunately stalled in terms of where that's why Roger was contacting the board members yes. to get him. Okay. Exactly. So, um, has there been in, so there's been no discussion, Tom, at the board at this point? Nothing since, and I didn't come in until April. Um, after this, I came, I was uh, attending, but sitting on the other side of the table. Okay, all right, thank you for that clarification. And, uh, and I don't know if uh, members have a hold that it's worth bringing back to. I mean, I hate to pull this as an agenda item before the board of trustees, but I think the work Commissioner Cornell was doing was just for that. It's like. Are we just totally off all together? Because now we have a new board, you may have a different feeling. And so again, that's a bit of why you have everything before you. What's the earliest we could do that, Miranda? What's what's that? What's the earliest we could get it on the uh, bring it back to the board of trustees? For further guidance. Mm -hmm. We've got one more next week. Um, but I don't know if that's the the right venue and if the planning commission feels like it should go to the board for better instruction. I feel like it could, I do feel like I'm still sick with you all and that like you let the board know, here's our recommendation. I'm not sure it needs, I mean, members of old, correct me wrong, I'm just not even sure it needs to go back to you. I think the planning commission can give, can craft it from here. Frankly, I think it's where it belongs. Okay. Right here. I agree. If we can, because we can't give them the whole thing like we have. Yeah. It really has to be narrowed down and focused more. Yeah. I have a question on what's currently in the code, and we don't want to change some of that. Like, I know there is a leash law, and there are, the head has always been in the past where you registered your dog with town. Are, these are things we probably don't want to change. Like, I don't know what the yeah, feeling I, is, but I think I mean, it's, it's already currently in code. Yeah, so anything with the ordinance number underneath it, our sections that we pulled from current code, and we didn't eliminate things from current code. Any section of the code that doesn't have an ordinance underneath it is something new that was integrated. And that was a safety thing on the leash. Right. You know, right. when it comes to registering animals, I do think that's something we'll have to definitely assess with Boulder County a bit because we're not maintaining like a police admin function. Right. So I'm just not really sure like that I think you, all. Right, it was, excuse me, through the police yeah. that we had the registration. So again, so something that needs to be fleshed out more in this transition. But yes, we did incorporate, I believe, I don't believe we took anything out of the current ordinance. Mm -hmm. no. Everything's in there. Okay, good. St Stephanie, could you give us some of your comments, please? Sure. Yeah, I think that um certainly I think this I'm I'm um the the comments that came in on simplification of the code really resonated with me and the enforceability. Um, you know, we don't have animal control up here. Um and it also seemed like some of the the small animal elements of it um were potentially, you know addressing a problem that we don't actually have, um, given that we haven't, <clears throat> this hasn't been a, a major issue in the town. So I am definitely for um, simplifying and streamlining this quite a bit in the next version, um, you know, and focusing on addressing the, the issues that we were, were originally trying to um, think about with this, which had to do more with, uh, with the larger, um, larger animals versus just you know dogs and leash laws and things like that and um you know we have ordinances for barking dogs and all those other things already so uh and, and making it overly overly complicated of course also makes it much more difficult to enforce so <clears throat> i do think that we should keep our keep our focus um on the you know on, on the original reason why this was why this was brought to the planning commission in the first place but it does sound like you guys are going to go back to um, the the process and and think about a ver another version, or this is sort of you know early version 1.0. Um, and so I certainly look forward to to seeing future iterations. But yeah, I do hope that we can simplify it quite a bit. 
Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Timmy. Yeah, a few comments. Um, I echo what Stephanie was saying regarding kind of keeping the focus on the larger animals. Um, already on our code, uh, we only allow you know horses, donkeys, llamas, and mules. I think is the verbiage um, by special review in the mountain residential zoning district. So, what makes sense to me is just um, wrapping any other sort of livestock type of animal into that same thing, which I'm sure was sort of the original intent in the first place. Um, I think it's unreasonable to really have any allowance for goats and llamas and any other kind of actual livestock animal in any other zoning district. Um, you know, to have a to even be talking about having a llama in high resident high density residential in old town, I think is kind of ridiculous. Um, additionally, we already have in our code um, you know, well defined stuff about what kind of animals are allowed and not allowed. We define what a pet or a domestic pet animal is. Um, you know, that includes dogs, cats, and guanas. Um, every little thing you can imagine, it's not like a wild African animal or something like that. So, um, I think a lot of that regulation that we're talking about is again all already in, in the code. Um, so I don't know. How much more complicated we need to make it other than um yeah i think we need to regulate any allowance of pigs or goats or sheep in any sort of zoning that's not mountain residential again to conclude i would just wrap any sort of livestock animal into we could review it for mountain residential but but that's it You're suggesting something like a, you know, table that you typically use that has each zone in it, and then perhaps exactly. Uh, in chapter sixteen, we use group table. Right. You know, it says like private home stables, um, which includes horses and donkeys and llamas, but not goats, which was the problem, mm -hmm. or pigs, right? Um, so that was the whole, as I understand, in the whole code was, oh, well, there's nothing stopping me from having a goat or a pig in my, um, uh, that's so high density residential, right? Um, so I think wrapping those kind of animals into that same use group and how we're doing it with private stables or horses or llamas, I, I think makes, makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. And we don't really have to change much other than, um, <clears throat> add goats to uh, that special use. That makes sense. I'll skip over Roger for now. Jim, do you want to? Yes, thank you. Uh, just to clarify, from what I was hearing, just to kind of summarize, we worked from our start, so we went with the kitchen sink approach. We pulled everything we could find in white communities and put it into this and are presenting it saying, Let's figure out what kind of direction, which one pull out of there and, and where we want to go. Right. And, and, and so far we're hearing there's a lot more in here than what we need. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I will say that uh, to include even these use group tables for the number of animals, that, that's all. These are just something you pull from somewhere else and that those can be determined are still too digital. Absolutely, yes. Okay. So people online who have more than uh, four cats and dogs in your house, don't, don't worry about it. We're not, we're not sending the police to impound your animals. Um, I, I heard what uh, Commissioner Blasher said about the SRU done by staff, and I thought that what if they were to do an admin SRU for certain things, and you said that you would notify all the neighbors within a 300 foot radius and then they would they then be allowed to give you input if, if that was approved there that process Correct. yes <clears throat> and maybe i could just clarify so obviously our recent situation that kind of brought us here that's not in code now and, and the way in which we we obviously defaulted way back to state statute which is why we determined these animals were allowed because it wasn't clear in code so we're going to default to state statute where yes it is but under this, we are saying absolutely we want to give the public an opportunity. But we also were mindful that like, is this really a planning commission 
or is this something that could be handled administratively? And let someone file the complaint concerned about us issuing a license, then I guess there has to be another level in which now this is reviewed because it is larger than an administrative black and white decision because there is now opposition. Well, and I wondered if that was what exactly where I was going, if there couldn't be something in there that triggers a larger SRE process, i.e., you know, neighbors coming out, you know, the input is the neighbors are like, no, <laughs> you know, and, and, and you know, I don't want it. And then you set the staff up for potential. Well, we think that it meets the requirement and we're going to allow it. So, so maybe, maybe we could shape it in such a way that if there is opposition, I guess maybe that could be it. any opposition to the, that, then there's a, a process where that could be come along further. Yeah, um, and I mean, just really quickly, the SRU doesn't speak to that, but we actually did kind of view it like liquor. Like, you only hold a public hearing for liquor if there are complaints, okay. and it would be very similar in nature of like that's a triggering of, okay, now there needs to be a hearing. And so, and, and, I, and when we met with Britt about this, we kind of talked about that safe built might actually be uh, the enforcement or in some form as far as issuing tickets and, and a summons, but then. There's confusion on how, what the next step would be if Boulder County would come to the door with them or, or anything like that. Right, so they can do some of this code enforcement, but when you're starting at this place of like impounding animals and vicious animals, like that is way above and beyond code enforcement. And that is that Boulder County component that we really have to sort out. Okay. Of what, if we sent those sections to them, what are they gonna say, you know, you didn't pay for animal enforcement, this is like, you know. Well, and then they could then come back to us and say, okay, you know, for the next contract, you're going to have to have that in there because you asked us to come and deal with the situation. So that might solve itself. Um, what about grandfathering folks that already have like hooved animals or, you know, horses or they have greater than the number here? Is, is that something that, that is open to where, you know, we wouldn't, I, I, I don't know, I think it would be hard to say you came and did a process that was, Previously allowed, and now we're going to say, okay, we're putting this new process in, and you're going to have to get rid of the two year dollars. Right. We definitely wouldn't want to go retroactive by any means with this ordinance, but I do think that there would have to be consideration. Maybe an example would be you have 10 domestic, say you stuck with the domestic animals, you have 10 domestic animals, two of your pets unfortunately pass away. It does not mean now you can go get two more. It means now you are at the eight, you are in compliance with code. And so as there is a, a, the unfortunate passing of these animals, you would then look at code compliance, and that's where that would take effect. Okay, and, and then lastly, and I'll, and I'll stop, majority of any enforcement action is complaint based, right? So, 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 so we're, we're not going to have the Gasapo out there knocking on doors, wanting to have your animal count and find out where you're at and okay sorry you know little snowballs got to go with me uh because you know you're over your count it's this is going to be based on you know there's a problem and it's come to the attention of town hall yes that is, that is typically what's happened today and a bit of why i was you know my my comment to the board about law enforcement was animal control was needed because it, it would kind of change like what would they do most of the time they would go and you know actively then enforce this code where right now we really are being more responsive and i think and this is just my assumption is that some community members do want that responsiveness but in the, in the goat situation there was this feeling of whoa there's just not enough regulations here um you know i think had there been regulations that then we were responsive that situation might have been a bit different okay. well I, I my my feedback then for the keeping animals subcommittee is that we cannot regulate every single thing under the sun. And that situation was kind of an anomaly. We can kind of address that. So that situation comes up again. It's it's just like Timmy said. Well, we'll have it you know designated in what zone we have these items. Uh, but I, I would caution against trying to figure out how we can get everything in there and figure out every situation. Uh, then you end up with an 18-page ordinance. Thank you. That's all we have now. The rise but well, yeah. Yeah. But not a fun. Well, I put also, the game, read the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing to add to the tail end of that is also when we put it as next discussion or action, let's not include anything that's not going to change. There's existing code, like there's code in here, I guess, that I didn't realize was existing. Because the public got a hold of it, saw it, and we got a whole bunch of 
confused feedback. Um, yeah, so the reason that we brought it to you in attorney minutes and I talked a little about this, that maybe it's not like a straight repeal and replace, like a repeal and replace often you're not going to really have the red line because we are pulling one and replacing it. But there was a question of like, does this just belong in 16 altogether? Do you pull it on the 7 and place it in 16? So um, we did agree that we would do a red line because it did not feel as quite of a repeal and replace. And yes, you know, I did some of the comments I saw, people were upset about things that were in current code. And I was like, you know, that's that's an interesting aspect too, is when you put out a code like this and it makes it just all look new, you start to realize that maybe there are some issues within just current code itself. And one of the, um... Comments when we were talking with with Rick the other day, you know, we do have a code enforcement officer that wanders around what Thursdays or Thursdays, um, and if he comes across something that is obviously, um, you know, wrong, he can bring in see your attention as well. So it's not just totally complaint driven. It's just to clarify that comment. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, so Roger, I'm gonna let you kind of wrap this up for for now, and then we're gonna open it up. We'll take a break, and then we're gonna open it up to public comment, and then. Well, you got to You should have a chance to, of course, oh, yeah. take. Right. Um, very quickly, though, it was whatever it was uh, last May June after we got this committee together, we actually did this poll, and it came back with some very inconclusive information that it was about 60 40 that you know people felt that we should be allowed some animals and it and it came created because of the goat situation um and then various people responded it really wasn't all 100 119 but um and, but then you had had maybe 30 or 40 people said that i feel like we should have uh ducks should be allowed 30 people said uh, we should have, you know, the ghosts, what's wrong with the ghosts and 30 people or thereabouts, pros and cons, where, you know, let's, let's have, uh, rabbits and, you know, the small animals. And then there was one joke about a water buffalo, but there was actually no request or no demand <laughs> for the large livestock animals. And we were actually looking at the goats and we I actually found a very nice one in Fort Collins. For you know, keeping of goats, and, and if, we, if it's done right, it could probably work. But they were these cute little African goats too, so they're really they were smaller than you know a large dog would be bigger. So you know, somehow, so I'm back to my saying, Roman song and dance. But um, you know, I'm still having issues with the larger livestock. I if I'm from, you know, commissioned or, you know, a charge that do that. I feel Tim's comments, the idea of, you know, uh, mountain residential. And then we would, if you think that you're, the ordinance is large now, when we get to the specific criteria of what it would be for the animals, but I, you know, it could be done. And I think under that circumstance, it's really the only way to do that. I just can't see. You know, they've the livestock in Sunnyside, you know, anything smaller, 16,000. You actually don't even, if you didn't have a house, it would be enough acreage, really, or land to actually care for an animal property on 16,000 square feet. Um, you know, that, you know, it takes up, you know, here, everything. That would just be that would probably be close to appropriate pasture for uh, animals or goats. So, um, I would work for that if I, if that is the charge. Um, and I think that's, you know, should be the criteria of doing it, but I, you know, somehow how we got there, that would be fine. But, um, you know, I, I think that's what we need to do and it needs to be very thin. We need to work on a very strict criteria for review or just have the ordinance so clear that staff doesn't even now they can monitor it or you know maybe go go get the order but you you should be able to make if someone is allowed to have uh goats or some other you know livestock battle or mount residential you should be able to make the specific code enough that it's clear you know how to do it and really all they have to go is get the say the permit 
it shouldn't even have to be a review or a public hearing. You know, always had that option. If people say it doesn't complain, but I, I, that's what I would visualize that you would be able to get the code and the clarity of, you know, what size corral, how far from property lines, all those things can be written in the code so it can be, you know, it can be done. So I can't imagine doing it less than that. But now I won't. I still would like clarity. I think we need to actually say which specific animals are allowed and then have that down and the other ones aren't. Otherwise it goes on and on. So you know exactly which animals to plan for and, and how do you protect them and all those different things. Um, right. So I, I think that's it. I guess I've stated very much how I feel about cows and hogs <laughs> and pigs, <laughs> but that's good. Water. And water bowls. Water buffaloes. Okay. Um, so my list was pretty much already covered. I grandfathering in uh, animal control office for defense height. We drop into this as well. Um, I think I was telling uh, Jim and Britt the other day that we had a, you know, we've got a split rail fence that's probably about five feet, something like that, decorative thing. And it's most just jumped over completely without even from a dead stock. So animals can you know jump over you know fences quite a bit. Um there was some issues with the in the definition section about small animals and chickens and fowl and and so forth. So those duplication we have to clean that up. We have duplication and clean up. Um the the use table that uh, Tim brought up and asked him about. I think that's a great idea. I was going to bring that up as well. Code enforcement officer, um, the SRU, you know, discuss who does that and what's the process, and then change chickens for zoning. But that goes back to that table. So that's essentially, and you covered the, you know, the others we talked about. Okay, so. Uh, 905, I think we'll take a five minute break and then we'll come back. We'll open it up to the to the public and um, get some more comments from them. Then we'll come back to the commission and try to wrap it up to at least get you know, some coherent uh, input from the committee. It's kind of seven. Seven. Okay, so you did want to, I think there's someone buying around the neighborhood. Oh, we have these here. Oh, I have it. It was like, yeah, you're you're right. Right. Okay. I don't know if I have a pencil, but I think that there's one. Well, just to make some notes, I'll be done with it. No, no, I mean, I have a pencil. Is that a pencil? Yeah. I want to remember that. That's all I'm going to do. Yeah. 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 So you worked on this too? Yeah. 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 You know, I didn't think about it. You know, like, oh, yeah, I'm just imagining that. Right. Yeah, that. And then there was also like. So what's there now? Yeah. We also. So I was trying to get in the community. Mary's case. I'm taking care of this. Like, there's properties I know that have raised their attention. But I think you know it's going on. I'm doing this much. Have you ever seen that? I actually just work on the big group. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Because I'm 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 like, yeah. Because Pretty scary, but I mean, I don't get it. You know, it's one thing, yeah. I think it's one of the things, 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 yeah. I think it's one of <laughs> Probably. Um, I'll need the notepad back, but I don't want to rip. It's okay. I would rather you know, have it on the to like write. So, yeah, just Thanks. take it and so we can rip it out after and then just okay. send it on book back. I just want to know. Yeah, no, that's no problem. I just know it's a pain, a pain right on that thing. I think I ran out of that. 
can be Yeah, I'm going to try to, I mean, I think everybody made really good points. I think your point about the predator magnet, I mean, some people had some coats up on 128. And we had this big pile of these to come around, come up people. That thing would just go up and down the things, up and down, up and down. Yeah. And I think that people, you know, what scares me, especially when I'm seeing some of the stuff, mm -hmm. is it's not how big your place is. In New York City, where yeah. I drove a horse cab, take it to a horse and a three story barn. No pasture. No it's just the problem. I'm going to try to clarify with Jim. So there's Alicia, um, and then the whole like thing, the um, um, the mountain residential.
Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I oh, know that we just left on there was a note of just identifying yourself because those online, there's newer voices in the room. And so those online would appreciate if people could identify themselves. Okay. That's a good point. Okay. Are we recording? Yes. We're done. Okay. Um, so at this point, I want to open up the discussion to the public and we'll start with our people in residence here may if you'd like to come forward and speak for three minutes and just name and address you know the drill thanks steve please turn the mic on just press the button yeah, green light on the green light should... no i don't see it this button yep there you go well that's a sensitive button thank you steve Thank you all for being here and for your very, very um, good discussion tonight. I think I'm reassured. I understand um, when I did radio reporting, I always did the same thing. I'd drop everything into a file and then you pare it down. I think we should have started with our original ordinance. That's how I did my file and then drop everything down. And I think we, once you get the pieces that you want to put in to the old ordinance as much as possible, I think you want to do that. And I think that the more you can do that, the less blowback you're going to get from people that are changing everything. You know, the dog ordinance, my daughter Elizabeth, a lot of you know her as a postal worker. She's running mail out of Lyons now, and she said there's a woman in Lyons that was telling her, they just did a revamp of their dog ordinance and her old blind dog doesn't wear a leash in the yard or when she walks it. Her neighbor's been taking pictures of it and she's got $400 worth of fines now. So I'm glad we don't have an interest in making this as a money maker. Um, I want to really quickly agree with Linda. The predator magnet issue is really important. I think I have seen them stalking goats up on 128 and the coyotes just run up and down the fence. If you don't have the fencing right, you're just asking for kills in your neighborhood. And then, then it just goes on from there. Chris, I, you know, I agree with everything you said. Just want to add to my cat thinks he's a dog <laughs> and there's about six cats that we have hours in the neighborhood. Everybody knows the cats all get along. There's no uncut males. That works just fine. Um, I think the question of where you're going to allow it uh, in terms of zoning is really important. Um, I think Big Springs is the only place, and maybe Sunnyside and my neighborhood in Dyer's Edition. Or people might feel like I have an acre, I have enough room. And as I was saying to some of the other people, where you keep your horse and where you take the horse to pasture doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing. So um, I would just like to ask that you definitely grandfather my two. I know if I die, my daughter's probably going to move in and. She's going to want to keep horses too. Um, we've kind of got that down. We have a one acre pasture. So at one point we qualified for a three horse permit. Jim Reese is nodding his head. He confirmed that with Alicia um, earlier today. So thank you very much um, for your very curious reading of all the comments you've gotten. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. If you have any other comments, I know she did submit an email, but if you have something else to add, at least send it in because that gives the committee, you know, hard copy to review. Okay. Thank you. Do we have anyone online? Kathy, did you buy? Okay. Go ahead, Kathy, can you, are you online? You know the drill, name, address, three minutes. Is it my turn? It is your turn. Um, before I take 
turn. Before I take my turn, I'm going to ask the board members, before you speak, can you please identify who you are when you speak? Because I'm watching on my computer, and the camera doesn't cover the whole board, nor can I even identify who's who. And uh, and when I posted in the chat who's speaking, instead of Miranda telling me who's speaking, she deleted the chat altogether. So um, if, if everyone can just try to identify themselves before they speak, it would be really helpful for the people online. Okay. <laughs> Kathleen Chippai, 32-year resident, 20-year business owner. Uh, First, I never saw a public notice of the subcommittee meetings or any documentation of what occurred, who attended, or who's on the board. The last board, aside from Julian, didn't think it was urgent or that changes needed to be made to the code. Apparently, staff is trying for a different result, and I hope the BOT puts an end to moving any of this forward. Um, second, none of the proposed language additions or repeals were identified as such with capital letters or lines through. I decided not to waste my time comparing the Muni Code language word for word to figure out what the heck was going on because the AIM said, read the whole thing, there's changes throughout. Um, third, exactly how many residents requested these changes and based on what actual problems? Uh, to me, this is yet another needless code change. Uh, it seems to be rooted in people with control issues, and this is about the people who uh, wrongfully, I mean, they complained that animals, goats were being abused, and then when the authority came up and said they weren't being abused, that should have been the end of it. So we learned in the discussions yeah. about the hiring the Boulder County Sheriff that staff had only needed to call animal control assistance one or two times, and tonight Miranda <clears throat> once since she arrived four years ago. My guess is that one call was over the goats, and that ended up being moot because they weren't abusing their animals. Uh, we learned that the animal enforcement officer would cost 26000 a year, and I don't understand why we're wasting any time repealing and replacing any of this section of the code. A year ago, a neighbor thought another neighbor was mistreating goats. The accusation was shared with the proper authority in Boulder, who came and inspected the situation and deemed it humane and lawful. No one was abusing any animals, and no one was breaking any law. The outcome didn't sit well with the complainant and possibly two to three of her friends, and they showed up at two to three board meetings asking that the code be changed to regulate the keeping of animals more than the county does. And at one of those meetings, someone complained because Jen Feinloven and staff said that there was no legal means in the code to force or ticket people for letting their dogs bark outside all night long. Apparently, even our marshal, who swore to uphold the code, never read the code because Section 7-35 Section or letter L says barking, yelping, howling, or mewling by canine or feline is prohibited. And uh, section 1 72 allows for fines of up to 2,650 per day. We don't even need law enforcement. Somebody just needed to call and complain, maybe record the barking, and turn them in, and, and the town administrator should be enforcing this. And if anything in this chapter is changed in this section of the code, everyone who owns any of these animals is grandfathered in, just like the dead guy ordinance was grandfathered, a dead body. And Roger concerns me when I hear him repeat things like, we should write a code that says what animals are allowed, and if we don't include your animal, it's not allowed. That is not how legal language works. That's not how, that's how codes end up confusing and worthless, okay? We abide by the law. We don't, we, we you can't say only these animals are allowed and anything we didn't mention is illegal. That's just outrageous. Just pollutes That's the code further. And again, I hope Jen Madsen isn't going to spend much time and, mu and the town taxpayers aren't going to spend much money for reviewing any of this language. It's unnecessary. Thank, thank you. Okay, uh, who else do we have from the public? Thank you, Catherine. Look, there are cameras, but there are two other members of the public. Anyone else wish to speak? This is Steve, by the way. Can you hear me? Somebody just... Hello? Who, who's this? 
This is Angela Seavers. I live on West 4th Street. Okay. Um, I'd like to. I'd like to bring up a few concerns that I have about the or the draft ordinance. First of all, I am an animal keeper and I am also a pet owner. And um, I am also a neighbor of the um, issue of the goats. So I've been involved from the very beginning. And I think you guys should probably listen to some of what Kathleen should probably mentioned because a lot of it is actually factual. Um, second of all, I do want to point out that keeping animals. There's a difference between pets and keeping animals as livestock. So I want to make sure that that is clarified if there is um, changes to um, any ordinance whatsoever. When we keep animals as livestock, they are often treated differently than household pets. For example, when we keep chickens, which I have chickens, if my chicken gets injured, I have to kill that chicken because it cannot survive other than if I do something dramatic to take care of it. That is just the nature of taking care of chickens. And I apologize to the vegans and the vegetarians out there, but that's just the way of keeping animals. So in the code that's been presented, there's a section that says you cannot slaughter animals. There's a lifestyle to keeping animals that are not pets. And I don't believe that is being addressed in this in this draft. I think it's important to speak with people who keep animals so that you guys can better understand what the lifestyle factors are around keeping animals. There are major holes in what's in the draft right now that do not speak to the regular upkeep and maintenance of animals uh, for livestock purposes. And those are purposes that keep animals healthy, that keep your spaces clean, that keep it regenerative, that keep it sustainable. That um, points to my last concern, which is that nobody on the board or in this entire ordinance, this draft ordinance, has spoken to the sustainability factors of keeping animals for food purposes. And that's a big portion of lifestyle. It's important to include that because there are people who use their animals to produce food and to feed their families. And if I personally didn't have that opportunity, I would have to change my lifestyle. And I don't think that it's right to put this new draft ordinance on the people who are actually living their lifestyle to be forced to change that lifestyle, even though everything that they're doing is appropriate to the upkeep and maintenance of taking care of animals. So those are two main issues that I would like for the board to address. The lifestyle, how people who are currently using animals to feed themselves, to live sustainably, and also for sustainability purposes, how does this actually touch on Envision 2030 and Envision 2020? Where are we seeing sustainability measures being put in place in this draft ordinance? I don't see any right now, and I would like to see some. Thank you. Thank you. And did you submit any written comments or an email? Uh, no, I did not. Okay. It, it would be helpful if perhaps we could bring up those two points and and send that in. And I mean, we have it on. Sure. Record, sure. But it would be good to have that for the committee. I will. Thank you Thank very you. much. Okay. Anyone else raise their hand? No. No. Okay. Well, with that, we'll we'll close the the public uh, input portion of the discussion. We'll bring it back to the uh, planning commission. Um, Roger, I'm going to um, like I did with Chris. Um, if you'd like to bring up any uh, questions or issues or more um, clarification that you need or you feel the committee needs, maybe we can start there. Uh, from what you already heard. Yeah. Everything I say is maybe, maybe give some direction. I certainly, um, you know, the idea of uh, possibly, as was suggested, you know, Mount Residential, you know, going through that process, something like that would be very helpful for me to, you know, to go forward to say, yeah, this is definitely the consensus of the planning commission. 
you know, that's so far I haven't heard that. Other than you yeah, talking yeah. about what animals would be in, yeah, you know, what animals zoning? or yeah, you know, what zoning should we look at just like Mount Residential or should we look across the board? So I guess I could certainly use any some uh, zoning guidelines going forward. Sounds like I'm not going to get particular animals, yes or no. <laughs> uh, I still don't know how that's not totally, at least a question is appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, I started to know that in the suburban residential there in that county, it's very specific that your chickens, bees are allowed, and that's it. Could could we start with like a like a draft of what they have and what animals are allowed and for that particular um, zoning? Well, the county is just. Well, that's what it was. But yeah, well, no, I, I, I think it's for us, for me, it's been, you know, say what we need here in town, yeah. you know, mountain residential or, you know, high density, you know, what, whatever you guys feel, you know, a little direction for the uh, committee going forward. You know, and then plus, uh, you know, Mike too. So there's two, two team members. Sure, sure. Um, Be nice to. To maybe have a like a a draft use table or something, and we just start filling it in, and people can and comment and it or something. Or make the or, or add add to it, or add what animals. Could be allowed in which districts? Okay. And does anyone have any other? Uh, I mean, about the districts, I'm kind of looking at the zone, zoning map, and it's, you know, Old Town is low high density, and then Sunnyside is medium density. Those are, those are the kind of more restrictive areas, for me, right? But the uh, mountain residential could be less restrictive as far as economic bridge. So that's what I'm thinking. I mean, you've got material already in what you've collected to be able to, you know, identify how much space is needed and use that as a starting point for for the different zoning districts. Well, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. But while certainly the uh, smaller animals are totally different, you know, hen house right. is 20 square feet. Fine. That goes across the board. Right. Well, no, yes, what I talked about with Tim's example was we're talking larger both to what livestock, which okay. So, okay, so you're saying let's start with, I got it, that, you know, what what would the crowd, what would be the reasonable space mm -hmm. to, to have the animal? Then, and we really haven't done that and really got, there's lots of information. So good husbandry. And get the guidelines and then go from there. I hear what you say. Okay. I think I that's my suggestion. And one more part of that is Chris. <laughs> um, the the because we kind of talked about pulling out the parts we liked and taking the existing code, leaving it the way it is, but then figure out what we want to add. I'm almost thinking I'm sure you guys on the subcommittee will say. This bare minimum makes sense. This is what you advocate for. And then maybe there's also a another problem of maybe we should also consider these. So I don't know if there's like the two 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 different categories of suggestions. These are gonna address what everybody's concerned about, bare minimum, and then maybe these are improvements or changes that you guys recommend. Um I think that would be helpful. I mean, and that way we can kind of see, okay, we have our existing code that's this. This is going to address the major issues that the public's concerned about. And then these are improvements that you guys recommend uh, that are we take our leave. Okay, Thomas. Yes. Stephanie. Yeah, Stephanie, do you have anything else to add? No, but, um, I, I still, you know, want to be sure that we're not getting into the, um, the realms with, with the, with, you know, dogs and cats and whatnot, as someone mentioned earlier, we actually do have ordinances that we can enforce 
around that and it doesn't seem to be um to be the core of the, the issue here i do think that for for some of the the larger animals that we're talking about there's a combination of, of things to balance there which is not just the, the particular zone say mountain residential but um more importantly potentially the size of the actual um, lots and uh and how and how they're structured so um i think that might be the better a, more, a better criteria to use versus just using um a particular uh particular zoning area but i do look forward to seeing the next version it sounds like you guys have your work cut out for you <laughs> so good luck and thanks for thanks for getting it this far okay thank you tom do you want to say anything from um, your perspective from what you've heard no, I, I um, hadn't thought about Angie Sieber's uh, comment um, until she brought it up. I'm glad she did. But there's a ferocious amount of homework that went into this, and I appreciate it. Um, I, I guess is a, is a lesson to me. I'll be really careful on any saying anything flippant at the part of the uh, trustee level. Sure. Because it creates a lot of work. Okay. Thank you. Um, anyone else, Linda? Do you have anything else to add? Um, the only thing that uh, I don't know if this was brought up in, in in the draft. I don't remember seeing it. Would be um, the animals being separate from the residents that they wouldn't be allowed, like adjacent to um, the residents. They would have their own living quarters, but it wouldn't be involved with the the actual house, the. Yeah. So, the house. I mean, you know, that would be an issue with the safety well, health and health. But I, I did not see anything like that. In the, in the That's one of the comment I had. Okay, Jim. This is Jim Reese, and. Uh, from the comments that we got from the public about this, there seemed like there was uh, some concern uh, about the uh, or, uh, where where they come and they uh, impound. That's the word I'm thinking about. The impoundment process and how will that work, and where will the animals go, and and and, and again, this was in let's throw everything in that we can find in other communities kind of uh kind of effort here and then start paring it down but i just wanted to double check with miranda uh we're not looking at trying to regulate how long dogs are going you know it had information in here about you know the dogs will you know, or the animal will be kept for five days and then they will have to go to a shelter and and all this and there was some concern that we were going to suddenly start impounding people's animals uh and, and i just kind of wanted to one, be sure that is this something we're going to try and develop because we don't really have the capability within our town to do it. And and two, you know, did, did you want to allay the public's uh, fears that uh, somebody's going to be, you know, taking your animals if you, if you can't get to them within five days? Two parts, yes. Um, the seizure and impoundment is already in our current code. The entire seizure and impoundment section of code, and so there was no change to that to the five days and and some of that stuff that is current matter municipal code. So that's why it was very fascinating to see some of this because it was like, well, that's what code is now. To your point, it is that law enforcement component that we can't necessarily keep with language like this because we don't know what our future law enforcement can and cannot do at this level. So this is yet another section. I think anywhere you're where you're looking at. That animal control division or any reference to that, those we're gonna have to take a deeper look at. But this I do just want to know this actually is in our current code. Well, well then uh, this is Jim Reese again. I, I would then echo the what was said uh, by Chris that it would be excellent, uh, very, very helpful to see maybe the existing code and like we had in, in one of the earlier ones where it had everything, the changes in all caps and strikeouts so, so we can see exactly what we're looking at possibly adding or taking away because i mean if it's in the existing code and it hasn't been a problem up to now i don't know that we want to change it where 
or I don't know, I mean, I'm not on this animal subcommittee, maybe you guys do want to change it, you know, but, but uh, I would think that if it's already in there, we want to keep what's existing and then uh, add whatever we need to, to address the problem that we had last year. That's all I have, thank you. Or at least let you know, so you can uh, read and review. Right. So, yeah, that would make it easier to, this is Steve, be easier to review it. Um, and, um, so, Roger, I was going to um, ask you, you know, it makes sense to try to pull a lot of the stuff into one, you know, that's what we tried to do, you know, you have chickens and, you know, that was in 16 all by itself and so forth. I still think that's a good way to go, um, you know, to pull it all in together, to move them all. Yeah, can I just let, maybe I should ask a question, so Miranda to Steve, so I put in what I got from that idea of, uh, you know, I was pushing for a zoning or whatever. So maybe Brandon said, well, yes, this is what I wanted all along. So possibly the review process would be if we'd actually look at good husbandry and decide which animals are appropriate where, and we could do a whole lot of that work, and I would save and put it into ordinance guidelines right there, that would save Brent an awful lot of you know, the review, but possibly that is what we need to do in lieu of or in jointly with the review process is to actually get this good husbandry for every zone and see where these all fit. Like chickens across the board, right. goats might be here, uh, water both flows here, uh, or not at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha, but I shouldn't use that hogs or yeah. cattle, that type of thing. I think that's a nice logical step. Okay. So, um, that, okay. So, uh, so did we ask Attorney Madison for any input at this point, or is, uh, do you have anything from the legal side um, to add, Jennifer? I don't really. I think it's the conversation is just so. Um, broad brush right now it's it's so general um i did have comments on the draft related to uh, mainly to organization and structure i think a lot of the things that you're talking about should be in your zoning code because you're regulating land use um so think about that whether you want it to be in your zoning code um and then also my other comments related to organization and and structure is if you're going to issue permits or licenses um, to think about how you go about doing that. As Miranda said, the criteria isn't really developed there, but then um, you need to have a process for if if you're going to issue a license, is this an annual license? And then if there's a revocation of the license, how is that what does the revocation look like and what's that process? So those are the really general comments. And I and I would say that overall the code is very robust for a town of your size. Okay, that's great. This is Steve, thank you. Um, so so Roger, what, what do you think the next steps are? What, what do you think the timeline looks like at this point? Or I get, this is Todd. This is Todd. <laughs> uh, uh, next step, Roger speaking. Um, well, I, I think we have to get, get these things together and within the next week, two weeks, reform our committee and see where we're at. The sooner the better. So, um, yeah, we well, we okay. just get our get with that Mike and see what his schedule is. I'm out of town just for one week in here, the 24th, 25th, and then we're back at them. Okay. I would say yes. And we also just so people know, we got lots of letters too, that there was some good information yeah. on them too. So we will go through those, and uh, you know what I see is. I'll work with Miranda to get an entire list of, you know, here's input, and we will go from there. Perfect. 
So when you think maybe a couple of months to come back to the planning commission again, or what are you, what are you realistically thinking? Yeah. Well, we'll just play it by you. Yeah, I think, oh, no, yeah, May is very realistic. I would agree. I don't think it'll be fully by ready for April, but I would like to May. I think yeah. that sure, and I'll feel safe. Rather not drive this on now that we've officially introduced it into the world. Got it. Um, I, was, I was thinking May, yeah, but. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. For an update. Yep. Yeah. 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 No, we don't expect them. You know, probably draft ordinance yet at that point, but at least an update. You have a quick comment? I think we close the public, but. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sometimes there's one more minute. I really just wanted to. May should probably come. You may should come up to the Appreciate you letting me get another minute in. Or, or, um, may chair on that one. Just a couple of things I think. For the subcommittee to maybe focus on. Um, there is a lot of question about what zoning is appropriate for what animal and what animals are appropriate in that one. I think for one thing, you need to look and see how many mountain residential lots there are and spend time accordingly on drafting ordinances. I don't know how many there are, but I wouldn't think there are a lot. The other thing I want to just maybe get everybody's opinion on before the subcommittee goes off and works, and that is, for example, my lot borders a large parcel, which is mountain residential. Some of the lots in Big Springs at the top are flat. They're actually ideal for a cow or a horse. So I would say that in general, I agree, mountain residentials probably the place for a cow or a horse. I agree with the lady that spoke on 4th Street that having a cow, goats, is a sustainable lifestyle. But I think you've really got to zero in on what you're going to do about the goats. And understand that in Europe, South America, and just about every other country, people do live with animals practically in their house. That's how they do it. And if you are a good husband of your animals or the husbandry, you can make it a very beautiful and sustainable lifestyle. So I think you should really carefully consider even having an experience quotient for people who want to apply. Thank you. All right. Uh, that, I think we'll stop. Uh, if anyone, uh, planning commission members or public have any further comments, please send them in. Uh, very helpful. All right, let's move on to 6.3 discussion item. And this is just basically a staff update on the recommendations on the development of parking in town. Yeah, right. So, I guess you want me, guess you want to start? You can um, brand to start and then. <laughs> but the uh, we didn't get name into the packet. We're like last minute, still working on it. This is coming before the board of trustees, so we would encourage you to join that meeting on the twenty first. But I'll just do kind of a verbal overview. Um, you all may recall Commissioner Glasser and Vice Chair Reese had done that work on parking in Netherlands and uh, presented the PowerPoint and. That it had a little bit of a stalemate, you know, it didn't necessarily go anywhere, but uh, town staff recently picked it back up and are coming forward with what we believe to be next steps based on your recommendation. So, first, if you recall, one of the first recommendations was to put a moratorium on the way in which parking is calculated in the central business district, as well as a moratorium on the paid parking fund. The moratorium is set to expire in October. And we are recommending that it be continued for another six months. Six months, yeah. Six months because there is a parking study or a transportation multimodal plan study that will, we believe, help provide a bit more guidance on that. We are not subject matter experts on how to calculate parking. So we'd like to continue the, the moratorium until April so that in that transportation multimodal plan, there can be recommendations on how parking should be calculated. 
So that was number one of the recommendation that was provided. Number two was to develop parking spaces throughout town. And so I believe we had had like 10 parkings. I don't even know about that. A lot. So we narrowed it down to, to the top four that we really want to financially invest in developing. Um, that would include Lakeview down to Rodeo Port. It would be the Old Town Shop. And so that's 26 spaces. The Old Town Shop is upwards to 80 spaces. Parking out to PETA Park better, which is upwards to 40 spaces. Um, and then also just better designating the 11 spaces behind uh, the gas station on 3rd Street. We were asked by the Board of Trustees to come forward with here's what we need to do. However, we did not budget for the parking development in 2023. So it does create a little bit of a complexity for us where in order to effectively build out parking, we really need to have parking markers. Um, and so Mark Hall streets manager found these interesting markers that can go kind of straight to the ground and pop up just slightly, um, only good in the summer, <laughs> but still a, a viable option, but it's about $15,000 that we would need to be able to purchase these parking markers that we did not budget for. So that's something the board really needs to consider. And also being mindful that parking wasn't a part of kind of their plans for the summer. And so we're also maybe looking at the board doing a slight increase in the overtime to be able to pay them out to do the work. However, we also do recognize that after the, the planning commission came forward and did their presentation, this multimodal plan then passed and came forward. So we are wondering, you know, is there value in maybe holding off on financially investing in all these spots? If say the parking transportation setting doesn't deem those spots viable. So it's something that really to wrestle with, but we are presenting to the board as maybe you wait. I know it's not an ideal response, but maybe you wait until this plan is done. And just to make sure that these really are the good spaces to build. But if you don't feel like waiting, it's fine. We just need that financial investment under a supplemental budget to make these spaces happen. In addition to evaluating the parking spot, we did talk to the mining museum. They basically said, whenever we're not using it, you're welcome to have it. Um, that's only four spaces, but four is better than none. Uh, and the area historical society is considering allowing us to park on the really far outskirts of the uh, steam shovel lot. Uh, so that's again, probably another four spaces. There we go. So. We hope that we could then sign these as uh, public parking so we could start to, but again, we'd like to have markers to show that. Tom recently let go our uh, agreement with the Presbyterian Church to use their lot in public parking. We did reach out to them and asked if we could re enter into that agreement, to which Mark Stringfellow, who we believe oversees the property, um, did say yes, we'd be happy to revisit this agreement. And at the time, we let it go because we didn't have the personnel to plow and be effective partners there. So we do now feel like we have the staffing needed that we can re-enter into that agreement and sign that as public park. Miranda, you want to Yes, please. Just I mean, on the leadership team at the uh, Presbyterian Church. And the only part of that agreement contract was <clears throat> Public use at any time except for Sunday morning right. in exchange for help with plowing the parking lot from the town. There's no financial, uh, you know, cost or anything other than you know the, the staff. Right. So and so that was really um, Chris Peltier was here at the time and we we're like, how oh, do we renew? And we we're just really struggling with keeping and maintaining a team. And now that almost every department is fully staffed, it actually parks handles uh, the parking lots. The parks team is very solid, and they felt like yes, they can enter by. So that's great. We also called RTD finally, and RTD said, "Sure, you can build a parking garage on our lot, but at your expense." <laughs> they said the ridership is not high enough for it to be worth their expense, but we are more than welcome to. However, a parking garage costs twenty-five thousand dollars a space. So even if you made it just another level, two-story parking garage, we're looking at four million dollars. Again, another however is that there is funding out there for these types of projects under Dr. Cog. So I have, I'm hoping to talk to them before this goes before the board. Um, you know, the parking garage have not 
been loved or hated necessarily. I think people are pretty neutral and just wondered if it could ever be. RTD really felt like you can do whatever, you can expand our lot. You know, we don't want to go into the hill and take away the flooding hill, but they said, like, do whatever you want at your cost. So that's a great movement, at least. Um, and obviously, a parking garage would help because it's about 160 spaces if we can make a parking garage happen. Um, you want to go over paid parking since that's your jam? Sure. So, um, my, I was kind of tasked with looking into paid parking for the town. Um, I really reached out to four, you know, companies that seem to be well known within the state, um, nationally, uh, globally, um, and uh, town staff, me, is really pushing for, um, I found a company that is specifically, due to our lack of experience, would take on the enforcement website, they have a 24 uh, seven local uh, call center that's located in Breckenridge, which I think is huge. Um, and it is a revenue split. So they really kind of take care of it and allow you to take on more as you have more time. Um, Idaho Springs uses it. There's, I think it's, uh, there's a couple of different cities and smaller towns, but Idaho Springs is most common to us. Um, they had great things to say about it. Um, and they're actually going to be presenting at the board meeting on Tuesday. Um, there was uh, three to four different uh, companies I also looked into, like Park Mobile, Park Fox, um, and all just come with higher fees and really puts town staff at kind of taking on that project. And it's just not something I currently feel that any of us have quite that experience yet. So why not go with the professionals? And then as time goes on, maybe town staff is able to take that on more and maybe kind of eliminate the revenue split. Maybe that's that. That's oh, what was the name of the first one? Your time Interstate parking. What I would say is I met with um, Idaho Springs a few times about this and the great thing I think about interstate parking is they're used to kind of the slow integration. That's how Idaho Spring started and like, just, you know, we just want to do 1st street. That's all we're looking to do for now. Um, and then the visitor center lot, once we repave it, they do, you know, the 1st 30 minutes free, they can do residents passive, all these things that people really cared about when we released the survey. Those were such important pieces. And they're willing to work with us on that. And I and Idaho Springs really has had they they needed all of them and they needed the cost sharing and now they scale it to Idaho Springs takes care of it within their staffing themselves, but they're very used to the model we're looking to do, which is mirroring Idaho Springs. Um, the board already budgeted for paid parking, so there's nothing to stop us from moving full steam ahead. We're basically just asking the board for the green light to begin contract negotiations with interstate parking. That's our parking update. Okay, well, this is Steve. I have a question. Did you who does the parking for Estes Park? I mean, that's did you talk with them at all? Or I didn't talk to Estes Park. I want to say it's Park Mobile that I personally use there, but I can't like 100% confirm that. In most cases, I found here Park Mobile is the app to go to. I have that personally downloaded on my phone. Right. Um, but I actually never got a representative to call me back from there. I know Idaho Springs used to previously use Park Mobile and they changed from them. Um, so it's just there was customer service issues, but I mean, Definitely something I could find out, but I'm pretty positive it's Park Mobile. I think it's Park Mobile. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, very good. Thank you very much. Um, good. So let's uh, wrap up with the, um, unless there are any questions for staff on parking at this point, I think to uh, encourage everyone to listen in or maybe come to the uh, board meeting, get more details and so forth. Okay, let's wrap up with the town staff report. Okay. Uh, let me get it. So, what do we have? Fun. Lots of fun things happening. First things first, the Netter Days. Netter Days is the town sponsored event that is occurring the weekend on the 24th and 25th. And we encourage you all to, to go to check out our website. We have tons of incredible 
uh, things happening like sledding events, a barnyard dance, a silent disco, a hot chocolate trail. Um, the point is to bring people into town and then also encourage them to go into businesses. So a lot of businesses are doing their own events and activities. And we're really excited to be able to um, support with this. And then Stephanie Handelman has been uh, someone we brought on board as an event coordinator, and she's worked alongside Peter Kasick, our administrative support manager, and Nikki Dunn, parks manager. Um, some of the events have options to donate, and Nikki has started a new donation, and that's geared towards youth programming. Um, her goal is to be able to cover the cost for youth to attend different recreational camps or things that they want to do, and so that's been a great addition into the parks world. Uh, we finished our budget, um, our audit, so, or excuse me, our budget book, and, and so the big shout out to Rita, it takes a lot of time, and now she's deep into the audit. We have a new sustainability coordinator. Her name is Leah Haney, and so she, I'm sure, will intersect with you all at some point in time or another. Erica Thorley is now the sustainability manager in the town of Um, Reimagined destinations. We did wrap up reimagined destinations, and that was really town working on ways in which we can encourage responsible visitors and. Um, we applied for another grant that was specific on branding and identity work. You know, when you think of Netherlands, what do you think of? And oftentimes it is tied to a, a private event. And so being really mindful that Netherlands has a lot to offer. And so what could our branding and identity look like? We're working on trails master plan. We have lots of plans in the mix, but we're working on a trails master plan update. We're also working on a housing needs assessment. So if you haven't had a chance, Go on and look at that interpretive map. It's really cool. You can drop pins where you're like, housing should be built here. Don't build it here. Here's some comments we have for you. Uh, we also have a survey now that asks you a series of questions. And a lot of those questions are related to zoning. There's a whole section asking kind of people's thoughts about in the EDU section of code or yard and bulk. And so it would be great for the planning commission to weigh in. Of course, once all the surveys are done and the public outreach is done, we will bring this to the planning commission because the goal is to then offer the board of trustees recommendations for code changes for how to ensure affordable or alternative housing. And that's all going to fall pretty much in chapter 16. Um, it's on the town website, that survey? It's on the town website. It's also in your packet, a link to it to get to the website. Bohan and Houston is our consultant, and they have a dedicated website to the Halloween needs. Oh, I know that one. It's the, yeah. the other one. And the survey. So if you go on the Bohan and Houston website and you scroll down, you'll see the interactive map. We have the survey now. But we're also going to send out an email and some social media stuff. Right? I like that. Yeah, I, I already looked. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be like two posts a week until because we're having a meeting um, April fourth, six, six, and that's going to be here at the community center as well. So there will be social media posts going out about the survey, the inter interactive map, and that meeting. So tell your friends. <laughs> Um, I always have the public works update and they're better at speaking to their world. So read it, but 1, just huge shout out the town took over the rink facility effective January 1st. And the rink has never been able to stay open past March 1st, but this year, the team was able to continue operations until March 5th. Which I think is huge for the fact that this is the 1st time we've had the opportunity to run it. I do think that there's some value in putting the staff time. Behind the rink, so just a, a huge shout out to that group. Um, I think that's most of it. Uh, the other thing I don't have in here is the police of the Boulder County Sheriff's Office. We're obviously going to contact. We are doing this um, option C level staffing, which has some like fifty percent coverage components. And so we hope we believe the board of trustees will review that at their meeting next week. So next week's a big meeting for parking police, hopefully. And then also we're looking to do a loan for some equipment financing, which would allow our streets team to do a better job at drainage and culvert and all of that. Thank you. It seems to me you left out a very important update from staff that happened maybe yesterday. Didn't happen yet. So yesterday. Why, why it's not in the packet? It's not in the packet. Uh, I, yesterday I defended my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation, and. I am officially a doctorate of public administration. Good. 
three years of of hard work, right? Yep. Three years, yes. Yeah. So I rolled the doctoral program when I started as the town clerk. I just started here. And here yeah, three years later. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other business to be brought up? Uh, Roger. Well, Roger. And so on the 20, or excuse me, at the next board meeting, I mean, there's an annexation. There's oh, my goodness. Yes, yeah, sorry. There's the annexation town hall. Same thing with um, there's the annexation so town hall from six to eight. So it's before so, the meeting. And the purpose of that meeting is to talk to the public about why we let the IGA expire, what our kind of philosophy or feeling was behind the annexation ordinance, get some feedback from the community about what you might like to see if we enter into another IGA, and just kind of talk about next steps. So the regular board meeting won't start until eight o'clock that night because we'll do the town hall first. So that's two hours. Yes. Two hours. Okay. All right. Um, um, speed one more. How about because uh, there was a the group got together with um, Nicole on Monday and you know and they're in their updates. Well, they sent us emails that were been out there about getting started on the comp plan and other people are working on the comp plan. So where are we at on the comp plan and what's yeah. this? So Oh, the group. The board of trustees gave direction to town staff to uh, uh, pursue the energy and mineral grant through DOLA, which is a 50 50 match, and we're going to go for it for the comprehensive plan. The application is due the first week of April. Um, we would like to ideally start the comp plan process, assuming we're awarded um, early summer. That uh, does take it's about a year, it's a long process, but. Um, that will be, of course, led by, we're calling it a tiger team, we think, or some sort of making up different boards and commissions and community members. But we wanted to wait to form that board until we had a consultant, because we originally it was like 20 people on the board, and then it was you know five, and then what's the right number? So we feel like we need the subject matter experts to guide us through that. And the comp plan will also focus on the sub area plan being the central business district. Originally, we were obviously just focused on that. And the conversation on the seventh was really, yes, let's focus on the sub area plan, but we have to update the conflict. It's time. So the board said, go ahead and pursue uh, the grant. So it's a 50 50 match. So $100,000 town is responsible for, and then Joel and the other after. It's kind of good. Cost about $200,000. Okay. So I have no timeline yet on that. No, so we'll, we'll just need to apply first. Now, I don't expect to, to be denied funding, uh, but we will have to apply. Okay, speaking of DOLA with Dr. Cog, uh, Brandon has been working to try to set up a training for particularly us, the new plant commission members, and some of us that probably wouldn't hurt to have a refresher. You want to say a little bit about that as well? And, Yep, so at the April meeting, um, Dr. Cog representatives will come and do uh, a brief. They've got a longer training that they've done over here, just a couple hours. They're just going to bring their team to us and do uh, probably a high level overview of what it means to be a planning commissioner, what the expectations are, really what we need to consider when evaluating applications. Uh, I know Attorney Madsen has done it for us, but this is just kind of another land use group coming forward. Uh, so we'll meet with them on Friday to kind of talk about what, what we'd like to see. Um, but really appreciative that they're willing to come to us to do that training at your April meeting. Okay, I'll join you for that call. Okay. That's okay. Please. Question when you say that, are they going to do it during our meeting hours or are we going to do it before? Or? Dur the plan was during the meeting hours. I don't know if people are interested in doing an hour before. I mean, we'll likely have an application before you that. I think I think it depends on how busy your agenda is. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't want you to think maybe you just got an email to ahead of time to see yeah. if we, who could or wants to attend. Because I'd show up an hour early to do that, so that way we have enough time for our agenda items. Did you ever do that, Timmy? And um, when you were planning commission before, you ever did the training? I don't think so yeah, so I, it's good for for us to do it all again. Okay, 
And so you say, uh, I was just going to ask what, what else is coming up on the April agenda to this, at this point? Um, at this point, we anticipate the lot line consolidation. Um, ideally, Commissioner Rivera will bring back the fence code. That is it at the moment. I don't think we have any other land use applications in that. No, we do not. So if it's, um, if those are the only items, then we should we'll do the training as part of the regular meeting. Otherwise, we'll maybe um, yeah. do it before. So, okay. Any other business? Any other items to bring up? Questions? If not, we need to adjourn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Third, fourth. I'm just going to say, anyone opposed? Seconds. Meeting adjourned. Attendance. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for the discussion. Thanks. Good night, y'all. Good night. Good night, Tom. <laughs>